discuss. And what does that mean for the future of NATO, for the future of the transatlantic partnership? Um, the Center for Security, Diplomacy, and Strategy, CSDS, is uh, with the Brussels School of Governance, uh, has been a, a really important uh, partner for us here at CSIS. Uh, and our first event uh, took place in Brussels this past June, where we previewed the NATO summit in Vilnius, hearing from US and European perspectives uh, on the realities of burden sharing, uh, and also on US views uh, on, on our posture toward the Indo-Pacific, as well as uh, the potential enhancement of uh, EU-NATO cooperation. Uh, and four months later, we're here in Washington to, to now take stock of where the alliance stands following the Vilnius summit, the implementation of the strategic concept, as well as what we can expect from next year's NATO summit in Washington, where we will, of course, celebrate the 75 years uh, since the formation of the alliance. Um, that summit, I think, is, uh, is a real opportunity. Uh, I think there's also a danger that the Washington summit simply becomes a party where we celebrate the past. Uh, and what we hope w with events and conferences like this is that we begin to sort of outline an agenda uh, for NATO's next 75 years, a more positive uh, uh, agenda to move the alliance forward, uh, to confront the, the challenges that we face in the world today, but also the, the changing nature of Europe, the changing nature of the transatlantic alliance, and, and transform and help modernize uh, that alliance for the future. Uh, and so there's a lot to discuss, uh, and I couldn't be more grateful to have Daniel and CS SDS uh, here as a partner, and to uh, and for the two panels that we are uh, about to experience. But before we turn it over to our, our panel, let me turn it over to, to Daniel. Daniel, thank you so much. Yeah, a very a very good morning to everybody. Um, and let me first start by by thanking um, uh, CSIS for the for the excellent um, cooperation, not just on on the event today, but also in the previous event that we had in June. It's been really wonderful working with you. And as, as Max said, I think it also embodies a bit of the, the spirit of the project that we have uh, with these two events. And Max was also right in, in highlighting um, what might be on the horizon. I like the word positive and opportunity, but we also have to be realistic about some of the challenges um, that we face uh, in the transatlantic relationship. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers who have turned up today and come from far and wide um, for sharing their views of us today. And by the end of it, my, my hope, uh, at least from this event, is, is not just to take stock, but also to get a better uh, uh, flavor um, for where the transatlantic relationship is potentially heading uh, in the coming months. Not just in terms of um, the combined uh, approach to the war on Ukraine, but also, as Max has rightfully highlighted, a whole host of challenges which we will have to tackle together. So let me uh, end here by just thanking everybody um, and looking very much forward uh, to the two panel sessions. Thanks once again. Good morning, everyone, to those both online and here in person with us in Washington. Uh, on behalf of both CSDS and CSIS, I want to thank you for joining us today. My name is Sissy Martinez, and I'm a researcher here with the Europe, Russia, Eurasia program at CSIS. Uh, before we start, I want to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Public Diplomacy Division of NATO, for making this conference possible. Now, picking back off of what uh, Daniel and Max both just noted in their opening remarks, it's evident that we find ourselves in a time of unpredictability amidst the ongoing conflict in Ukraine and a series of crises worldwide, effectively creating an atmosphere of reduced security and stability compared to what existed 10, 5, or even a year ago. Now, NATO was created almost 75 years ago with three core tasks, collective defense, crisis management and prevention, and cooperative security. For the past 22 years since 9-11, the alliance has been consumed with crisis management and prevention. Now, fast forward to uh, 2022, when the new strategic concept was adopted at the NATO summit in Madrid, we've reflected and recognized the new heightened security reality that we're faced with, but also highlighting the return to focusing on the number one core task of NATO, which is collective defense. With the new strategic concept, the Allies agreed to a variety of new things, such as upgrading their defense plans by placing more forces at high readiness and assigning specific forces to defend specific allies, as well as pre-positioning equipment and weapon stockpiles in the east of the Alliance and much more. 
Now, the focus of our discussion today will be on addressing the rapidly evolving environment we find ourselves in, not only in Europe, but all over the world. Now, NATO's core task of collective defense is incredibly important here. It serves as the central component of NATO's strategy, spanning various domains, including cybersecurity, hybrid threats, and conventional military challenges. Given the topic, I'm so excited to have here this great panel of experts, uh, Jessica Cox joining us online, uh, Robert Bell, Christine Berzina, and Catherine or Kaki Elgin. Um, by way of introduction, here on the screen, but physically from Brussels, we have Jessica Cox, the director of the Nuclear Policy Directorate at NATO headquarters, where she provides policy support to the Secretary General and others at NATO headquarters on matters related to NATO nuclear deterrence, including in the Secretary General's role of chair in the Nuclear Planning Group. Prior to NATO, NATO served in a variety of roles at the Pentagon, but most importantly, and I just found this out, Jessica began her career here at CSIS as a junior staffer with the International Security Program. So in a way, welcome home, Jessica. <laughs> Um, second, we have Robert Bell, whose 45-year career in the U.S. government includes seven years as the U.S. Defense Advisor at NATO and Senior Civilian Representative in, of Europe for the Secretary of Defense, three years as NATO Assistant Secretary General for Defense Investment, seven years at the White House as President Clinton's NSC Senior Director for Defense Policy and Arms Control, and much more. We have Catherine, or Kaki Elgin, who is a fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, where she focuses on great power relations, U.S. allied defense strategy, and grant strategy. And last but not least, we have Christine Berzina, who is the Managing Director of the Geostrategy North Program at the German Marshall Fund, where she's responsible for leading programming on Baltic, Nordic, Arctic, and U.S. security and territorial defense issues. She also heads the security and defense portfolio, including analysis on NATO, U.S. foreign policy towards Europe, and U.S.-EU geostrategic ties. We have a great panel here um, who each carry a different perspective or expertise on the many challenges the Alliance faces. Now, Jessica, I'd like to start with you if possible. Um, the nuclear question is probably the biggest one there is and likely the one that deserves the most spotlight. Um, based on your role at NATO headquarters, how does NATO assess and manage potential nuclear risk and crises, both regionally and globally? Sorry. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Okay, now we can hear you. <laughs> okay, good. I think there's a bit of a lag between what you see and what you hear on the screen. Uh, at least that's what I'm experiencing too. But I was just saying that it's. I'm delighted to be um, at least virtually at CSIS. Uh, uh, as noted, uh, I did start my career post-college uh, in the international security program there. So it's always uh, has a, a soft spot in my heart. Uh, although we were in the old building at the time and the new building is much nicer uh, for all involved. Um, and I also want to thank the Brussels School of Governance uh, for inviting me uh, to participate. Um, so uh, as, as you noted, the, the, as Director for Nuclear Policy at NATO, uh, I have, uh, we've been really focused on the emerging nuclear challenges, not only from Russia uh, in particular, its aggressive uh, war against Ukraine, um, but also the other nuclear threats and challenges that are only increasing over, um, uh, over the course of the, the last few years. Um, first and foremost, of course, Russia has been using irresponsible nuclear signaling and nuclear coercive tactics uh, in conjunction with its illegal um, invasion and, and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. And we have seen continuous uh, nuclear signaling throughout the course of the conflict uh, to, uh, in an attempt to limit uh, NATO's uh, courses of action and to attempt to keep us out of the fight. And of course, uh, we uh, have been doing our utmost uh, to ensure that, that Russia understands that it cannot uh, uh, gain what it seeks through, uh, through the use of course of nuclear tactics. Um, but the, the fact that it has emerged as a, a key um, way that Russia is, is, uh, is waging this conflict 
uh, against an unarmed, uh, a non-nuclear nation is, is troubling. Um, and, you know, in, in the midst of the war, we're also seeing Moscow continue to uh, invest in the modernization uh, and development of, of Russia's nuclear arsenal. Um, we are seeing them continue to invest in both uh, the development of strategic uh, nuclear uh, missiles and delivery systems, uh, including uh, its new heavy ICBM, the Sarmat, which it recently announced uh, was entering um, into uh, production. Um, and also we're seeing them continue to use, uh, sorry, to develop um, their non-strategic nuclear weapons, including uh, the novel nuclear weapons such as hypersonic missile systems uh, that President Putin announced back in 2018. So while they are waging and fighting this war, uh, we are continuing to see them both test uh, their nuclear capabilities to use some of the platforms, particularly some of the uh, shorter range um, nuclear delivery systems in a conventional role, uh, and, and to continue to undertake uh, their nuclear exercises and activities uh, apace. And they just earlier this week uh, had a scaled down version of their strategic nuclear forces exercise. So while, uh, and I, I can't uh, forget to note that Russia also now claims to have deployed uh, nuclear weapons uh, into Belarus, bringing its nuclear arsenal closer to, to NATO uh, territory and, and, and front lines. So, so all of this is quite troubling when we, when we look at uh, our very near uh, uh, nuclear threats and our near nuclear region from a, from a NATO standpoint. Um, but we're also worried uh, about the nuclear challenges um, globally, where you're seeing uh, China really invest in its own expansion uh, of the scope and scale of its nuclear arsenal. The new uh, U.S. Department of Defense um, China Military Power Report that was issued just last week um, notes that Beijing now possesses more than 500 operational nuclear warheads and is on track to exceed previous projections uh, of the timeline in which they would reach uh, 1,000 nuclear warheads. So we're continuing to watch China's nuclear weapons development as well, which is really being done with a lot of um, uh, a lack of transparency and without uh, a good understanding from our side of why they're why they're undertaking this real uh, expansion of their nuclear capabilities and systems. And of course, we're also uh, closely watching North Korea and its continued nuclear developments, in particular its missile tests, and thinking about the implications um, of North Korea's nuclear developments. And then more close to home, we're also thinking about uh, Iran and its nuclear ambitions and, and making sure that uh, Iran does not, um, does not uh, undertake to gain its own nuclear capabilities. So the, the threat landscape is pretty broad uh, and pretty varied. And while most of our attention is on the, the near, you know, the near term and near uh, challenge uh, that Russia poses to NATO, uh, it is important to understand that we are thinking about these, these broader uh, nuclear challenges as well. Not that we necessarily think that uh, you know North Korea intends to use a nuclear weapon against NATO, but just the broader uh, geostrategic effects that any nuclear weapons use or any conflict with a nuclear armed competitor um, would have on the broader uh, geostability uh, um, and global stability of the world. So what are we doing at NATO? Um, I'm happy to kind of address kind of broader NATO adaptations. I think a, a lot of those uh, were, were noted um, in, the, uh, in the introduction on the, on the conventional front, uh, our new plans, uh, the posture adaptations, increasing the number of battle groups on, on NATO's eastern flank, um, having more ready forces uh, and capabilities and posture available and aligned to specific planning and contingencies. So all of this work is ongoing in the conventional domain. Um, but we're also looking very carefully at how we continue to adapt and adopt NATO's nuclear deterrence posture and capabilities in light of these growing nuclear challenges worldwide. And I would say one of the things and one of the real uh, 
changes that we started to make here at, uh, at NATO is to really think about bringing together nuclear deterrence and conventional deterrence and thinking about NATO's um, deterrence posture in a much more, uh, to use our NATO buzzword, a much more coherent way. Because we understand that if we're facing a challenge from Russia, we're not going to just face a nuclear challenge. We're not just going to face a conventional challenge. We have to be able to deal with this holistically. So just quickly, and I'm happy to answer questions to the effect I'm able uh, in Q&A, um, some of the decisions that uh, heads of state took in Vilnius um, was first and foremost that NATO will take all necessary steps to ensure the credibility, effectiveness, safety, and security of NATO's nuclear deterrence mission. This includes the continued investments and modernization of the alliance's nuclear forces, including the, uh, the transition of NATO's uh, dual capable aircraft from fourth to fifth generation fighters, which is ongoing, um, and the uh, life extension program of, um, of the US uh, B61-12 uh, gravity bombs that are being deployed to Europe. Um, NATO is also updating our planning to ensure that the alliance is able to address both the current and future nuclear threats to the alliance while maintaining strong political control over our nuclear deterrence at all times. We're all also continuing to adapt uh, the scope and scale of NATO's nuclear uh, exercises and broader nuclear exercise program. And as an example of this, NATO uh, just conducted our annual Steadfast Noon exercise, uh, which this year took place over the, the southern part of Europe. This is our annual and routine um, training event that ensures our nuclear deterrence forces are continue to be fit for purpose. Um, but as we've looked at Steadfast Noon and adapting our exercises, we're increasingly adapting them to, to exercise in more realistic scenarios, uh, to integrate that conventional support for nuclear operations that we, that we would need in a conflict, uh, and to think um, more, uh, more holistically uh, about the types of nuclear threats that we might face. Um, and we're also, uh, and I'll just as a final point to wrap up, um, looking at how we continue to reduce the risks uh, of miscalculation or, or misinterpretation um, and to reduce the risks of nuclear use in general. And again, we're looking at how we do that through planning, how we do that through our posture management, how we do that through our exercises, because our ultimate goal uh, is to ensure that there isn't uh, a nuclear use, um, but be prepared uh, to deter if necessary. So let me then uh, stop there. And like I said, I'm, I'm looking forward to our broader discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jessica. Uh, Bob, I'd like to turn to you. Um, in your sense, now, Jessica brought up Ukraine, what's changed with Russia, especially. Um, in your sense, how is NATO using the lessons learned from Ukraine um, to defi define its new capability requirements just for not just the near term, but thinking more long term strategy? The short answer is time will tell. <laughs> but first, thanks to uh, Max and my colleagues at BUV, Dan, Louis Simon back in Brussels, and Alexander, who's come from Brussels as well. For including me in your program. So a, a very important speech was delivered here in D.C. on August 28th, the Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks, in a speech she titled, The Urgency to Innovate, announced Replicator, which is in effect a, a crash program or what President Biden will call a moonshot, to try to field attributable autonomous systems at scale of multiple thousands in multiple domains in 18 to 24 months. And that initiative draws not only on lessons learned, you see, from the last 18 months of Putin's war against Ukraine, but also the Pentagon's assessment of what is required in addition to our legacy systems to deter what the Defense Department identifies as the United States' main strategic competitor or <coughs> pacing threat, the PRC with regard to which, Kathleen said, the key operational challenge we must tackle is one of countering mass, countering mass, just as Ukraine is experiencing in its existential fight against Ukraine. 
Uh, a few weeks afterwards, Kathleen met with the NATO perm reps at the Pentagon and presumably discussed Replicator and what NATO collectively and our allies individually might do in parallel and at pace to try to uh, match, keep in sync with where the U.S. is headed. It's important to remember not too long ago, in 2005, our, our friend from Brussels, former Deputy Secretary Sir Rupert Smith, in his uh, landmark book, The Utility of Force, wrote that, and I'm quoting him, protracted industrial scale, scale war, that is, war is a battle in a field between men and machinery, war is a massive deciding event and a dispute in international affairs, no longer exist. Unfortunately, it's clear that that prediction did not come true. Uh, while the volume of artillery being fired reminds us from Ukraine of World War I, the advent on a massive scale of drones in all domains and for a wide range of missions has resulted in a new uh, degree of transparency on the battlefield that makes either surprise or the concentration of force for either maneuver or assault extremely difficult. In a book released here at the Simpson Center uh, last month, IISS expert Jack Watling informs us that in the Ukraine war, Russia is firing 6,000 rounds of artillery each day for every three kilometers of the front. A similarly grim statistic was highlighted by Mike Sweeney, a recent article in Defense Priorities, that in a 48-hour period of fighting in the Donbass, Russia expended more ammunition than the United Kingdom has in its entire stockpile. Indeed, earlier the, this month, the chairman of the NATO Military Committee in Warsaw said that the bottom of the barrel of our ammunition inventories was already in sight. Turning to drones, in a May article in Rusi, Jack Watling estimates that Ukraine is expending 10,000 unmanned aerial systems each month. 10,000. And in a stunningly insightful article on drones written with Federico Borsari for the Center for European Policy Analysis last month, former deputy ASG for Defense Investment Skip Davis catalogs how woefully inadequate most, not all, but most NATO militaries are when it comes to UAV or UAS systems, and even more so with regard to countering the ability to counter those systems, including a deployment of electronic warfare capabilities within our land armies. And this is especially troubling given that Russia has recently announced that it intends to spend over $2 billion by 2030 just for loitering munitions alone. So taken together, the requirements we face in terms of modern warfare require not only the preservation and enhancement of legacy systems and the reestablishment of robust production lines for ammunition with surge capacity, but also the incorporation of new innovative technologies while delivering in all three categories at scale and at speed. So, Missy, that is the challenge for NATO. <laughs> Daunting. And what's to be done? Well, let me suggest 10 things just cryptically within our time limits, and then we can go into any more in depth uh, in the Q&A. First, it's clear that NATO's bedrock Article 5 remains more important than ever. The Alliance's strategic concept clearly states that we cannot rule out Russian aggression against a NATO ally. And that has prompted all the enhancements, Missy, that you referred to as did Jessica. So in short, uh, this is not a drill, okay? This is not academic. Nor is it time to suggest, as some reports indicate, that former President Trump believes that some of our NATO allies are too small or too inconsequential to deserve protection under Article 5. I stand with former President Obama, who said in Vilnius that there are no big allies or little allies, they're allies, and that Vilnius, Riga, 
and Tallinn are just as important as London and Paris and Berlin. Second, it seems to me that in this environment, geostrategic environment, the 2014 Wells Defense Investment Pledge still matters. It's not a choice between funding enhanced legacy systems or funding emerging disruptive technologies or funding the reestablishment of resilience. It's all three and simultaneously. So the 20% and the 2% of GDP and the 20% for R&D by 2024 remains a key commitment, one that's been re-embraced by NATO. And 2024 is next year. It's no time, I think, for any prime minister to bluntly inform the Secretary General of NATO that his country will not meet the 2% period. Third, the long-standing principle of burden sharing based on reasonable challenge still matters more than ever. In this environment, the U.S. cannot be expected to continue to carry the preponderance of capability contributions in NATO. And for obvious reasons, not just the points made by others regarding the Indo-Pacific and our global responsibilities as we're seeing in these past weeks in the Middle East, but it, it's, it's also because in the nuclear area, which Jessica just addressed, the funding requirements are growing, not decreasing. In an era in which all the guardrails on arms control have come off, and there's tremendous pushback in the Congress and in the academic community against the Biden administration's declaration that we can hold the line at 1,500 warheads. You have to expect increased demands on U.S. spending for the nuclear shield. And of course, it goes without saying that with our elections approaching next year, it's especially crucial to show NATO skeptics and opponents that Europe is all in in terms of its own defense. Fourth, that means that the NATO defense planning process still matters, perhaps more than ever. It's a fortuitous circumstance or coincidence that this year, 2023, happens to be year two, step two, this is NATO talk, in the NDPP 2022-2026 cycle. And that means this is the year that NATO is to determine requirements, this year. And next year, before the summit, to allocate those requirements across the 32 member states of NATO. Here I'm assuming Sweden will soon be in. So um, it's more important than ever that NATO sees this moment to lock, not to make sure it doesn't lock in outmoded or obsolete legacy capabilities, but defines the capabilities that it's going to embrace for the near term and the short term. Uh, fifth, obviously interoperability and standardization still matters. Joint C2 still matters, that would be my sixth point. I think it's time to again review and streamline the NATO command system to include carving out a new northern command that incorporates the four Nordic states who really know how to work well together. And in speaking frankly, to review the role of Allied Command Transformation, perhaps it's raison d'etre in the first place. Uh, seventh, uh, it's incredibly important that NATO by the end of the year reach agreement on relevant joint warfighting doctrines, especially the ongoing effort to reach agreement on um, drone operations in contested environments. Uh, next, uh, joint procurement and sustainment have to be expanded. The, the NATO support and procurement agency support programs for drones is especially crucial as is the NATO's Defense Production Act approved at Vilnius. At ninth, uh, I'm coming to the end, air and missile defense obviously is a key priority. I think we need to ask, is it time to reorient and reintegrate NATO's Aegis-based BMD into its overall IAMD architecture with Russia in mind as complemented by the new European Sky um, Shield initiative that uh, Olaf Scholz has launched. And last but not least, to conclude, and here I'm drawing on points that Max began this discussion with, I think it's incredibly important that the summit in July be seen as a forcing mechanism, mechanism for adopting 
a new capabilities enhancement initiative to address the realities of what we're seeing. Uh, in fact, to use a phrase, a revolution in military affairs uh, in Ukraine the last months. So this means, as Max said, that the summit needs to be more than a celebration of NATO's distinguished and critical 75-year past, as important as that is. It has to be more than who replaces the great leader NATO's had as Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg for the coming years. It has to be more than wordsmithing the communicate language on Ukraine's future admission into NATO. It has to be the moment where NATO, at the head of state level, embraces, endorses, and proves a capabilities package that's fit for purpose, given what we're seeing in Ukraine and are worried about from, U uh, from China uh, right now. So as in operational terms, I think what that means is the CNAD uh, defense ministers have to up their game, increase the frequency of their meetings. The international staff and ACT have to come to the NAC at least monthly and brief how this step two, step three capability definition allocation process is proceeding so that when heads of state meet in July, they're not asking what is NDPP, but are saying this is the capability set we need going forward. As Skip Davis says in his articles, there is a window of opportunity right now, but it's closing and the time for action is now. Thank you. No, thank you, Bob. Um, that was incredible in outlining both the challenges that we face, but also steps that we can take next year because next year is the 75th anniversary. There are high hopes on what the Washington summit will deliver. Um, and so I, I, I hope people are actually listening and so action can really take place here. Uh, Christine, I want to turn to you. As a, a Baltic watcher, you really understand how the region has stepped up since uh, the invasion occurred in 2022. Um, and Bob just mentioned Europe is all in. The allies have stepped up. From your perspective, how is the, the Baltic region's step up so monumental and significant? How can this contribute to um, portraying NATO in a better light, especially in making the cases as to why NATO should exist another 75 years. Thank you so much to say, and thank you so much to CSIS and, uh, and to CSDS. Yes. Uh, like, we're getting my acronyms right, uh, to, to, to come together. And as someone who sat in Brussels for seven years and I was in DC, it's very nice to have that meeting of, of, of capitals and, and institutions here. Now, the Baltic states are a place where NATO matters perhaps more than anywhere else. Um, it is, they are, the three Baltic states feel profoundly strongly about their ties to the, uh, to the Euro-Atlantic in institutions, but specifically to the United States, the UK, to the long-standing security um, commonalities and mindset and relationships, the non-acknowledgement of, uh, of Soviet occupation for so long. And that depth of commitment and of history matters still today uh, in, in the relationships. The question of a potentially revanchist Russia has not been out of the question ever uh, in the Baltic region because history has not permitted uh, the ability to step back. Um, but it's not only in the Baltic region. I think we also have Finnish colleagues in the room who are aware of the fact that keeping your eyes open um, and east is important. Uh, so that is a reality. But what do you do about it, right? So what do you do when you don't have a great deal of depth and you're not as the size of Ukraine, but you do have a very strong commitment to institutions and you have contributed to Iraq and Afghanistan and everything to be a good internet, good Atlanticist, a good partner for, for NATO, a good partner for the United States. Um, what's really important is that you see almost a, it's, it's it's a laboratory in some ways for how to better operate across the alliance and to work on interoperability and common training. So the enhanced forward presence, which is in all three Baltic states, really is something that many treated with a bit of skepticism. What does it mean when you have a handful of soldiers from here, there, and elsewhere, all under different flags, come together in a base and attempt to do something together? Um, and 
the practice of seeing NATO in action when you sit down in a, you know, with people in these bases and you see that everyone has a common mission and they train and they're day in and day out and you actually see what NATO is. Um, and so how do you, how do you train? How do you, how do you uh, exercise together? How do you create a common sense of purpose? How do you improve a, or how do you create a better common uh, threat perception across all the allies? These are things that are being tested and trained on a daily basis across the Baltic states through the EFP. It also is an area of mutual reliance, and the kinds of things that would be necessary in our zero are already being put in place. For example, airspace. So I know the Nordics are also doing this, but having airspace uh, be available across all of the states uh, at once, so you don't have to continually you know, ask permission when you're flying in a fighter jet in a very small place in the air, you want to do it quickly and smoothly, right? So how do you, how do you make it easier to operate? How do you rely on each other? Um, air policing in the, over the Baltics has happened on a rotational basis from other NATO allies for a long time. This is also an opportunity to, to test and be in the field. The kind of capabilities that the Baltic states are seeking to develop, it is absolutely purchasing air defense and HIMARS and coastal missiles and creating that NATO lake that we keep hearing about, but it's also providing a place for training in a real productive way that we don't really have in Germany and don't necessarily have the, um, the societal buy-in to have significant exercise uh, with, uh, you know, shooting and banging and, and, and bombs falling, like that is not something you can really sell to the publics in Germany or let's say in the Netherlands. This is uh, you know, uncomfortable. But in a place where the threat feels very acute, it's also an opportunity to test and to have enough societal buy to be like, yeah, that's kind of loud and annoying uh, over there, but we understand why, right? Um, and that usefulness to the alliance to provide this. And so, a lot about what you were saying is this high-low, right? So what, you know, you need cheap drones and you need really sophisticated systems. And, and Jessica, you know, you need a nuclear deterrent um, on top of all of it. So how do you integrate it? How, how do you test how all these small pieces fit together? And where is a place that has the appetite and where does it have a strategic value to test, right? So there's also a bemoaning of, you know, what, what can you preposition when? What are the long-term commitments to prepositioning something somewhere, right? You can get these fights of persistent or permanent or heel-to-toe presence. We've all heard these things. What matters is being there. And if you can be there in exercise, if you can be there frequently um, adding assets to all of the other allies, that is already extremely good, right? So this is, I think, an argument for engagement, and I think an argument for appetite, an argument for saying, sure, yeah, we, of course we need to spend more than 2% and we have to buy stuff because Ukraine shows, you know, even if you have stuff, it can, it can be really hard. So I think that approach of what the Baltics are doing and the proof that they have to make to the rest of the alliance of uh, being, of being responsible for themselves, of being a partner to everybody, no matter how big or small, and the advantage they provide for the rest of the alliance, to actually train, to test, to see, you know, what is it like to do all of the new things that we're going to need to be doing. Thank you, thank you, um, Kaki. We'll we'll top it off with you, and then we'll go to Q and A um, before having a small discussion with us. Um, we've been given a lot of food for thought so far. Now I want to zoom outward, look at the bigger picture. How do you see? the current, the overall direction and um, of not just the alliance, but also the challenges that we're facing. Um, while yes, naturally, there will be challenges and moments of real testing for the alliance, but the, the picture can't and it should not be so gloomy because of all this growing list that we've just outlined. Um, there, there must be opportunities as well. Um, what do you take of it and really just returning back to collective defense and practice, not just the same talking points? No small task. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, so thank you to CSAS, thank you to uh, CSDS for hosting us, thank you to Sissy for, uh, for moderating, and thank you to my co-panelists for what I think has been thus far a great discussion and I'm sure will continue to be. So I think we all know that the unity after Russia's illegal reinvasion of Ukraine provided incredible momentum for NATO and its member states to refocus on its core mission of collective defense. And that is no doubt a really good thing. 
But the point I want to make today is that that doesn't mean the job is done. Um, I'll reference some of what Bob talked about and what Christina and um, Jessica has also talked about, which says that NATO, NATO really needs to both accomplish what it's already promised and get the present jobs done, but also, and this is where I'll spend the bulk of my time, and importantly needs to think about and prepare for the future of the alliance, right? And this has also been made reference, but I'm gonna to try to put some sort of intellectual teeth into it. So first on getting the present job done, and I'm sure we'll continue to talk about this, not only in the Q&A, but also in the next panel. And now that both the NATO political side and Secure's team have made commitments to reorienting NATO's defense posture in Europe, it's time to make that a reality. Right, we can talk about exactly what that means, but you know, first off, the pledges about the new forward presence and the existence of new defense plans are important first steps, but there's still clearly disagreement among members about who should contribute what and what exactly that vision is. Right, as Christina referenced, is it a permanent forward presence? Is it persistent? Is it rotational? Is it a reinforcement-based model? It could be different in different areas, but that's sort of a lack of clarity, at least in the public discussion. That's also not to mention, as Bob spoke about, the investments that need to be made, and importantly, by whom. And that's not only member states, but what should be in the collective pool or what should be delivered by individual member states. And that includes, of course, um, things like military mobility, which is still a problem, ammunition, long-range fires, ground-based air defense. All of these things are major areas in which there needs to be significant investment. So in sum, and again, I just say this to open up the conversation, progress has been made. I don't want to underplay that. There has indeed been progress, but more needs to be done, and hopefully we see some of that in the coming months. But so now on to my main point, which is the future, looking further forward, because there are clearly current problems that need to be solved, there are current weaknesses that need to be mitigated, but we can't lose track of what's gonna happen in 20, 30, 40 years. So um, slightly smaller than Bob's 10 points, I only have four. <laughs> um, so four, four points I wanna to touch on. We love a list. <laughs> you know, it helps organize us, right? Um, so first, what is the future of warfare? And how does NATO start preparing for it now? Bob again mentioned some of this. And I think revisiting and modernizing collective defense plans is obviously a good start. There are at least two aspects that we need to start putting some more intellectual capacity, uh, capability and capacity into as both a public looking in the NATO and NATO internally. The first is not just how quickly Russia might reconstitute, but how and what lessons it's learning. And even if it attempts to reconstitute in a certain direction, does it actually have the capability to do so? What lessons will they learn? What do they really look like? What does the Russia threat look like in the future? But second, I think, you know, it's sort of differently here to touch on, you know, what Bob really spent some time on. What is the role of new technologies? How do we think about high-low mixes? How do we think about the role of unmanned systems and counter unmanned systems? How do we think about potential threats to in space and elsewhere to communications, to command and control? What is our vision for the future warfare? Right, some of this work is being done in different places. Uh, Diana is a notable place for the investment side. There's analytical work on EDTs, um, emerging disruptive technologies. There's work on strategic foresight analysis coming out of ACT, as Bob mentioned. But it's hard for me, at least, to see how all of this is coming together into a vision of what warfare actually looks like in the future and how NATO, again, is preparing for that now. So, for example, ACT developed the NATO warfighting capstone concept, which I haven't heard a ton about recently, um, which is focused on five development imperatives. So just to look, lay those out quickly, the future warfare, according to this document, thinks about cognitive superiority, layered resilience, influence and power projection, cross-domain command, and integrated multi-domain defense. And clearly, you know, I don't know exactly the conversations happening inside NATO, but these things need to be part of the conversation we're having our preparations for defense now, so that we start putting them in sort of place for the future. How are these ideas represented? How are these imperatives operationalized? Right? How do we actually take them and make them reality? In other words, how should NATO pull together all of these different ideas about future warfare into a coherent but ultimately flexible vision of future warfare and integrate those into the plans that are being developed today and in the future? And we know that EDTs, like artificial intelligence and big data, will increasingly make military capabilities dependent on being intelligent, interconnected, but also distributed. And so what are the bureaucratic mechanisms what are the standards, what are the interoperability mechanisms that are necessary that we need to start thinking about now to enable that becoming a reality in the alliance? Because our deterrence is also ultimately about our ability to warfight. So we need to think through these issues, think about you know, successfully warfighting in the future. And we need to make these intellectual, bureaucratic training and RDNA investments now so that they're in place when the time comes. So that was what is the future of warfare. The second point is um, how does NATO shape its environment in the future? Right, NATO is, of course, a de defensive alliance, but I believe it can be more proactive 
about creating a conducive environment to its interests, and about imposing costs on adversaries. Here we could take lessons, I think, from the US concept of competitive strategies, which is essentially shaping a competitor's choices during peacetime in ways that benefit our objectives. We could adopt cost-imposing strategies to encourage your adversary to invest in areas that ultimately won't be very useful for them. We could create problems for the adversary. You could also find and exploit asymmetries. The question is, how do you do that in NATO context? But I will point out that I'm not the only one who's thought about this. I mean, this point in fact that um, warfighting capstone concept I mentioned identified the need for NATO to be both more anticipatory and more proactive. And they emphasized balancing between shaping, contesting, and fighting. So how do we do more on the shaping and contesting side is one of these key questions that I've been thinking through. It doesn't necessarily mean that NATO will always be the primary actor. Of course, um, sort of the unity of membership is important. There will be disagreements. But NATO can serve as a venue for its member states to have these very important conversations. NATO's an alliance, though, I will say, can do a couple of things to shape Russian defense perceptions, decisions, and ultimately actions by, for example, um, demonstrating NATO's strength and presence in places like the High North, especially in Finland, I think, near the Kola Peninsula, it offers an opportunity to really cause issues for Russia. There's talk of phone ops around the Northern Sea Route. But we can also you know, increase our presence in exercises, et cetera, and our signaling in places like the Black Sea and the Baltic. Again, all in a mission to sort of signal to Russia, hey, we're here, we're deterring, uh, but also you know, trying to force Russia to think through its own investments. And Finnish membership already is forcing Russia to devote precious resources to that part of their, um, the country. Right? So that's an example where Russia is having to you know, sort of shift its own resources internally in response to NATO, as opposed to NATO responding to Russia. But importantly, too, competition is as much about uh, attempting to shape your adversary as it is about ensuring your own competitiveness. So there's a degree of this that, of course, NATO needs to ensure that its member states are as strong as they can be, as resilient as they can be. And again, I think sort of serve as a venue for having these really tough but important conversations. All right, so that's uh, future warfare, shaping your environment. The third is below threshold activities, which are not going away. Um, I applaud very strongly the focus on collective defense, um, but NATO needs to have a conversation, and it is, I know it is, but if there's a more meatier conversation about how to step up on collective defense while also still supporting its member states and more day-to-day sub-threshold competition activities. One idea, and I I think he's in the room, I have Sean's in the room. Uh, one idea that I have to credit Sean for here is if the Joint Expeditionary Force, for example, was originally built to help uh, fill a bit of a collective defense rapid response gap, and if NATO's stepping up there, how can we think about using organizations and entities like the JEF um, to provide more support on the competition side? How do you really build the meat to the DDA? And NATO can do this, of course, in cooperation with the EU. Um, as a resource to help these member states, but it cannot ignore these actions. It can't pivot so hard to collective defense that it ignores the sub-threshold activities. Because sub-threshold activities, data to competition, it would ultimately set the conditions for when a conflict does occur. And as collective defense in NATO hopefully gets better, below threshold activity may actually rise in importance as states continue to seek ways to, to demonstrate their interests. All right, so that's, uh, again, small things, right? <laughs> Future warfare, um, shaping the environment, below threshold activities. And finally, um, I just want to ask the question and get the you know, room thinking about how the alliance can accommodate shifting roles within NATO. Uh, this is a problem we've talked about for many years, but it's also a problem that's not going away. We saw great unity after, um, immediately after February 2022, but we have both new members. Uh, we have new concerns from existing members. We have renewed voice and confidence from existing members. Uh, you have existing divisions emerging again. You also have the United States, as Bob mentioned, that is not only increasingly pulled into other regions, but faces increasing costs. So how can NATO as a membership really think through these, um, accommodating these shifting roles and think through the future of the alliance, ensuring that we are as, as steady and tight as we can be? So all right, those four things, plus the, the first, right? So that's making current promises reality, thinking about the future warfare, shaping the environment, and thinking about uh, below threshold activities, and shifting roles in NATO. So my bottom line really is just that the job's not done. There are opportunities, certainly. It's just time to start thinking about them. So the job's not done only, not only for what we need to do in the next two, three, five years, but also further afield in the future. And some of that thinking and investments need to start today. Thank you, Kaki. And uh, I'd be remiss not to give a quick shout out to Sean because I was waiting, Sorry, for, Sean. I was waiting for someone <laughs> to bring up the Jeff. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, 
Um, so there's a lot of food for thought on the plate here. Um, but thinking to the future, thinking, and I'm also thinking next year with the Washington Summit, um, because a question I hear maybe twice, three times a day is like, oh, what, do you, what, what are we, th what is the U.S. thinking for the Washington Summit? Um, and a big part of building the alliance, making the alliance stronger, the, there's the Ukraine question that we've touched on, but not entirely addressed. Um, and so this is an open question to all four of you. Um, there are a lot of, there are several unanswered questions on Ukraine post Vilnius. And Bob, you started to mention this, but I guess leading up to next year, how can the, how, how do you think the alliance is, is planning to both manage Ukraine's expectations, but also address the big elephant in the room? Do we think anything might happen next year at the Washington summit? I'm curious for your thoughts. And I pose this as an open-ended question for either one, anyone to answer. So I don't expect the, the situation to change significantly in terms of the in internal dialogue that preceded the, the language that was adopted at Vilnius with respect to future Ukrainian membership. The, the, it's not likely, let's say, that there's going to be a dramatic change in the status of fighting come next July. The, the challenge is going to be domestic here in the United States and increasing um, anxiety about the West staying power, particularly U.S. staying power. So the summit's going to take place in a huge political context here in Washington that's focused on the votes in November and whether or not we've been able to sustain congressional support for tens of billions going to Ukraine, and if not, what that means. Uh, in terms of the, the communique, my guess is that they'll adopt the same language that they did at Vilnius, uh, which says Ukraine will be a member when the conditions are met and everyone agrees, which is a statement of fact. Yes. I mean, so incredibly important uh, for next summer and Ukraine's prospects for quicker membership is of course the reality on the battlefield. Um, there isn't uh, a grand expectation for a very different reality a few months down the line, but I think it was also important not to say it's impossible or it's an impossibility of a different reality, right? So I think that the, um, you know, we, we, we see where we are and we are not maybe very imaginative, right? Like, so should there be a dramatic change in the battlefield? I think the reality uh, for Ukraine next summer could be very different, but barring a different reality on the front lines, I think that there is going to be a consistency uh, from all of the allies on what to do about it. I think the, what, rather than going though into a pessimistic na uh, narrative, because I think that was a big problem in the past year, was that there were incredibly high expectations going into Vilnius, uh, ones that were not met and frankly couldn't be met. And so that in many ways makes NATO seem smaller or weaker than it could have been. And so how do we both raise and value Na uh, Ukraine as a now close partner and the, and the ever you know, coming nearer through the NATO-Ukraine Council and other formats, uh, and how do we strengthen the the perception of the of the of the future growth and vitality and ambition of in terms of strength and, and rigor of when it comes to defense for itself of NATO. And here the partnership of, you know, the, why Ukraine should join it's not, no, no, would potentially not only be cheaper uh, to defend its, it in the long term, which is a, you know, a financial argument, but the Ukrainians can do NATO stuff better than NATO can do right now, right? There's a clear, once the fight has been fought in Ukraine, the Ukrainians would be excellent trainers for the rest of NATO of how to fight, how to fight uh, with multiple systems, how to do low cost, high volume, you know, drones in combination with more sophisticated systems. Can we start some of that teaching in the other direction? Because mm -hmm. the problem in our societies is a handout narrative where we are helping Ukrainians and they're just, I mean, yeah, they're dying, but like it's us, right? Like we are the ones that are doing all of it and how much do they want from us? the advantage to our societies, to the innovation potential of our own uh, militaries, to the 
you know, to the, again, the rigor that we take defense can be brought in the opposite direction. Can, but the narrative is much more about, so we're gonna train F pilots on F-16s. Well, how about the most uh, experienced and the most innovative military around, which is Ukraine, bring some of its Ukrainess to the rest of us. And if we talk about it more in this bi-directional manner, how does that also change societal or even congressional buy-in to these things? I mean, society is going to do, you know, reflect what also the leaders say in our parliaments and in our congresses. So how do we use something like the NATO Parliamentary Assembly or Congress here and talk about that lesson to us, the advantage to us from supporting and learning from uh, a different, uh, from Ukraine in this situation? So I think that as we go in, how do we not get our fingers burned? How do we not get incredibly disappointed? It is this reverse side too. What is Ukraine currently bringing and what will Ukraine continue to bring? And that's going to do more for getting to a yes and meeting those conditions um, than anything else. And so that, that I think is, is really important. And also to open, like keep supporting Ukraine uh, with weapons, with political and diplomatic supports to get to that different condition on the battlefield in order to get through those uh, additional hurdles as quickly as possible. Not only say that, but of course, we can also you know, help affect the conditions of the battlefields so that come June and then things may look to get different. I'll also point out, I really like Christina's um, point about you know, sort of shaping their narrative and really learning from uh, the experience in Ukraine. I'll just point to you, there's a political article, I believe from a couple weeks ago, which uh, discusses some frustrations that some Ukrainian soldiers on the front lines are having with NATO training. And they cite that there is some, are some really great aspects of NATO training, but there's some aspects with the NATO training has fallen short in their experience. So what can we learn from them in fighting the Russians that we haven't yet really experienced ourselves? I think that's a really great narrative point to sort of make as we, as we look towards Washington. I agree. I don't, I don't know, Jessica, if you want. Feel free to chime in. I know the virtual format is hard, but please feel free to chime in whenever. No, I, I don't. Um, I don't think my position um, varies greatly from the other um, uh, panelists. I would just, you know, point out that with the uh, new NATO Ukraine Council that was agreed in Vilnius, um, that does come with actually quite a bit of work. You know, we had uh, uh, a good um, uh, nook at the Defense Ministerial uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, where all allies really reiterated their support to bringing Ukraine closer to NATO in this intervening time, um, recognizing that we're not yet at a point where NATO, where Ukraine can join the alliance. Um, but that said, you know, enhancing interoperability, getting Ukraine training on NATO standard systems, um, you know, and of course sustaining, uh, you know, the military support. Uh, and non-military support for Ukraine to continue to enable them to fight and win this conflict uh, are all things that that a lot allies feel are quite important in in this period. Um, and I would also note that one of the I think um, important outcomes uh, that's often overlooked in our discussion on Ukraine is that allies to take the um, the step to say that uh, there doesn't need to be a map or a membership action plan or anything like that. That you know, basically, once uh, you know the the war has come to a a point where um, membership in NATO is is uh, you know is that we're able to invite Ukraine in that that, that will happen. So so I do think that we had to take some quite important steps in Vilnius and are and are doubling down um, on those mechanisms now to really try to bridge uh, bridge the gaps and make it as uh, feasible and possible for Ukraine to join the alliance when that time is right. Thank you, Jessica and Christina. I also want to give you a shout out on the analogy of we need to learn from Ukraine, um, because who knows, that might be the, the deciding factor that kind of contributes to strengthening the alliance and facing all of these challenges. We can really learn a lot from them. So thank you to you four. Um, I will open up the Q&A. Um, we have some mics floating around, so please raise your hand and we'll get to you. Oh, I don't know if you can. 
Is it on? It's on. It is okay, on. We're good. There we go. Just <laughs> closer to, uh, to my face. Um, Jeff Rathke from the American German Institute. Thanks for a great uh, uh, session thus far. I, we've got 14 points uh, taken together uh, from the two of you, uh, which are inspiring and insightful. I wanted to zero in, perhaps, uh, Bob, on your third point, um, and maybe the fourth one, too, and uh, hear from you, but maybe from the other panelists as well. You talk about the uh, reasonable challenge and yeah. the burden sharing. Um, and the strong implication is that Europeans need to take on um, greater responsibility. Um, I wonder if you would be able to go into a little more detail about the areas where you see that um, shift in the burden as most ripe, especially in light of your fourth point, which is the ongoing determination of capability targets and then the allocation of those to uh, allies. Um, uh, that would, I think, be uh, uh, quite, uh, quite interesting. You mentioned as well the uh, air and missile defense uh, uh, mission and the European Sky Shield uh, initiative that Germany has launched. I'd be curious uh, for your reaction or any others to the way in which um, uh, this is being shaped, in particular the fact that the bulk of the German expenditure um, uh, on its own national uh, air and missile defense plans is uh, going to the Aero 3 system um, and whether that is the best use of, uh, of money uh, given the threats uh, that NATO faces. Thanks. Yeah, Jeff, it's great to see you in person <laughs> after all, all of our Zoom contact. Uh, let me take the second one first. Um, you know, the European Sky Shield Initiative is, is interesting, it's welcome, and it's puzzling. <laughs> you, your organization had a good, great discussion on this not too long ago, and the consensus of the experts was that the Aero 3 is, seems to be mainly optimized against Iranian threats. Uh, there are other things in the package, particularly the, the short range and the shorter range missile defense systems, which seems to me bring great value to NATO in terms of counter UAS. But, uh, I just wonder whether there's an opportunity here to have sort of role specialization since the Germans um, in a welcome sense are putting priority on missile defense now to let them take, the, take on the mission of deterring Iranian ballistic missile threats against NATO territories, which seems fairly low probability, but is the rationale for the NATO BMD system that's Aegis-based. And then turning to the Aegis-based system, Assuming another year of war in Ukraine leads NATO, if not at this summit, at the next one, to take some fundamental decisions in the long term, going to your point, Kathy, about the future of NATO, to reconsider the NATO-Russia Founding Act, the three no's, the restrictions on forward deployment above brigade level, to reorient Aegis-BMD and incorporate it in the overall IAMD architecture. So that, it seems to me there's an opportunity there, but obvi it obviously fits into a much broader political strategic context about when NATO gets to the point where Russia having renounced, in effect, the NATO-Russia Founding Act, NATO decides that its self-imposed restrictions just don't make sense anymore. But that's a hugely political decision for a summit. On the burden-sharing point, uh, this is not new, of course, uh, going back to the Obama administration and a NATO defense planning process cycle, I think two cycles ago, right after the pivot to Asia was announced. Uh, the U.S., uh, Jim Townsend was uh, very much in the lead on this. Uh, for the first time, answered the NATO, the NDPP questionnaire about what forces are available for NATO, honestly, <laughs> or candidly, let's put it that way and sort of did a triage where there was a column that said these are forces that are static, like training bases or DMZ forces and aren't going anywhere. But these are forces that um, you can count on for sure, Europe, in a NATO contingency. And for the first time then we created a third column that was these are forces that maybe will be available but might not. And there are things in that third category, like the two carrier task forces and the Marine Expeditionary Unit that's in, in the Middle East right now, that you know, are earmarked for other deterrence missions or other conflict responsibilities. And we said, you cannot count on this. 
maybe, but maybe not. And I think the hope was that that would motivate a response from Canada and our European allies in the NDPP to at least reduce the list of mission areas where the United States is carrying more than 50% of the capability requirement, which is not supposed to be the situation. It, it's, there are too many exceptions to that in terms of theater missile defense, SEAD, air refueling, strategic bombers, radar systems. Actually, the French defense minister a couple of years ago in Washington gave a great speech at the Atlantic Council where she itemized all the areas where the U.S. is providing upwards of 70 or 80 percent of the overall NATO capability. Uh, the military authorities at NATO took that U.S. input and in their suitability and risk assessment report, which has got to be one of the more obscure acronyms in NATO. And I'm sure you know head of state knows what the SRA report is, let alone NDPP. But in that report, the military authorities said, this is significant risk. You know, you have been warned, in effect. But it wasn't evident that it deflected the needle in terms of the capability target allocation process in, in a dramatic way. So all, what I'm saying now is that it's worse now than it was then. The China pacing threat reality is more public and clear. The possibility of a wider war in the Middle East is upon us. North Korea has gotten worse, not better. The nuclear demands, as Jessica has outlined uh, in terms of Russian and Chinese expansion, not to mention North Korea, are growing. Arms control seems to be in the ditch. <laughs> So it just my point is that this process where the, the requirements are determined, taking account everything we've learned in Ukraine, and then the allocation of that consistent with what's supposed to be the 50% rule, fair burden sharing, and reasonable challenge, the reasonable challenge being key. This next uh, step three, which comes due at the time of the summit, is no time to just have business as usual. Well, and for me, I think key in this process is, oh, sorry, Jessica, Jessica, why don't you, you jump, why don't you jump in? Yeah, if I could, if I could maybe um, add a few points there. So, you know, so I think it's important that, you know, to recall that at, at Vilnius, all allies did agree uh, to renew the defense in, uh, investment pledge and to commit to that 2% being a floor and not a ceiling of, of defense spending. And, and I think that really built on the realization that not only did we need to ensure that we were modernizing and investing and taking all the steps that we already knew we needed to take, but you know, we now have a greater number of additional burdens um, on, our, on our military forces. And so this includes things like replacing all the stockpiles of munitions that we've been um, that we've been passing to Ukraine, replacing the systems uh, and the capabilities, making those more modern, more effective, and more capable. Um, so there's a whole range of things now that we, you know, five years ago when we when we um, did the last NDPP cycle, you know, were not on our radar. Um, so we have a, a lot more uh, on our defense modernization and defense agenda than we than we had before. Um, but I also think it's important, uh, you know, so we're right now in the middle of um, of the MCR development process. Uh, it should come um, to the political side of the house uh, for the I think the February defense ministerial. Um, but this isn't the only demand signal that's now being created, right? We have the new plans, the new plans which. Um, identify uh, specific forces and capabilities against specific threats in specific and uh, in specific contingencies and in specific regions. And so this is, and we're aligning the planning and the force requirements for the planning with the NDPP and with the um, MCR uh, and uh, the minimum capability requirements. Uh, in a way that NATO has literally not done, certainly since the since the Cold War. So we're using the plans, we're using um, the, the the new force requirements that are part of the plans in order to really make concrete those capability targets and the rationale for uh, the demand signal on on NATO's forces. 
Um, and, and I would also add that it's not just the broad pool of capabilities that we need, uh, it's also capabilities that are combat effective and ready. And so there's been much more attention um, into having forces that are ready and that are in place with stockpiles of munitions. You know, the concept that we've had, uh, you know, really over the last decade is this reinforcement concept and that, you know, with the new battle groups, the new, the eight new battle groups that will, that will be able to um, flex to, to battalions, it's quite clear that we can't reinforce from the United States anymore. So it's about having more forces provided by Europeans in theater, a lot of those being the critical enablers that um, that we used to think that the United States would be able to provide, and they might still be able to do so, but having more of those uh, logistical support and enabling forces in, in theater in Europe's hands um, is just really critical uh, to the executability of our of our plans as, as we look to the um, to the future. Um, and then, you know, the again, kind of the developing the stockpiles of munitions, having those pre-positioned, having those, you know, again, that, that has to be European investment for European capabilities. And, and all of this, I think, is, is a, you know, a, a pretty transformational approach to how we've looked at capability development um, in the past. Um, and and all of that being said, and and kind of to to sum up on this piece, um, it, we also have just a higher level of ambition this year in general, right? So so our 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 political guidance you know, makes clear that we have to be able to fight and win against a near peer nuclear armed competitor. This is a qualitative um, step above what we said in the previous political guidance. Um, but it also says that we have to be able to undertake out of area operations uh, if, we, if required to do so. So we have to be able to do all of this from the same pool of forces. So, so uh, I think we're all anticipating here that when the MCR does come in, that it will be substantially larger um, than certainly the last version in 2020. Um, and then that means, uh, and that those targets that are that are allocated and apportioned over the next you know next year are going to primarily go to to Europe and Canada, not the United States. So so I think there's there's a lot of work that is still to be done, um, but certainly um, you know there's certainly uh, much more that we have to do than two percent uh, is going to get us uh, get us there. So so I just want to um, uh, make all that clear. And just finally on Sky Shield. You know, I think there's something like 16 or 18 allies who have now signed on to be part of the Sky Shield. Um, I don't know what we're calling it, but the the consortium. Um, and while Arrow Three has gotten a lot of the attention, I think there is um, an understanding that it is going to go much uh, further beyond that in the broader uh, consortium of, of allies that are involved and engaged. Um, including things like the U.S., I think, is, has now committed to putting uh, Patriot uh, production facilities into Germany to, so we can produce Patriot batteries here uh, in the European theater, Patriot munitions. Um, and then there's a lot of discussion uh, you know, about what other allies will invest in as part of the broader initiative. Um, but one of the things I think that has been really important um, that Germany and others have, have signaled strongly is that this is part of NATO's capabilities. So this is for to fill those gaps in integrated air and missile defense that we know we have already and to try to put some uh, real focus and attention in this really mission critical area. So I'll just stop there. If I can hop in really quick, let's make a quick point, which I think we've got a real moment of opportunity here, um, right? There's momentum, um, there's real meat to the conversation, as Jessica just pointed out, that can allow us to really have concrete conversations about these issues. Um, and there's also, you know, a weekend, though, I will point out, very much not fully down uh, Russia at the moment. It allows us to sort of have these conversations a little more freely. And I think what's really important is both transparency and honesty, not only with allies, but with ourselves about what we can actually offer. There's some really good work happening by some, you know, some of us in the room trying to think through what are the capabilities that are fungible, what is duplicative, 
what's exquisite to a region or a mission, um, what requires a greater physical presence, what can be done remotely. These are the kinds of conversations that need to be had. And I know there's great momentum around the analytical community on this side. So hopefully we reach a point where we hop onto the momentum that's not only happening intellectually, but also on the ground um, in these NATO political and military conversations so that we can really make progress on this in the next you know, year or two. So, please. I, I both am incredibly encouraged by the excitement and the greater ambition that we're seeing, but I'm also concerned. Um, and the concern comes from the fact that I think NATO right now is in a, like would, you know, Looking back to 2014, like there's a 2014 scenario today, in 2023, NATO would knock it out of the park. There's no question that a 20, 2014 scenario would work anywhere, NATO wouldn't at all. Uh, now we're like, we can totally, we're gonna, pretty soon we'll be like in a perfect 2022 scenario, right? Like we can, we, we have learned all about what Russia does in the field and how they do it. Um, and we're going to make sure that, and, and we're also going to think about kind of like the long-term future, but we're also going to do like 2022 perfectly. But Russia's also thinking about what they did in 2022, right? And so Russia has kept a lot of its crown jewels, a lot of its naval assets, its air assets hidden. It is like, it is learning which one of its missile, which missiles are great, which missiles are less great. It, um, it isn't, it, and it also doesn't feel like it has to care about many other things at the same time because it's Russia. So uh, Russia can concentrate and can invest and it can learn as well. So how are we planning to adjust for what Russia has learned now before we do another cycle of this? We can't afford another cycle of being awesome against Russia in 2022. Um, and so this is, this is that concern. And this is why having that strategic advantage and innovating and thinking and actually why Ukraine uh, is such an important piece, right? Because it's getting outside of our mindset, right? Outside of our, much as these cycles are useful for planning, this is how we do things. And with so many allies in the room, you do have to have a bureaucratic process in mind. There needs to be creativity and there needs to be a bit of um, gumption, right? And I think that the importance of having Ukraine in the room and why I think the nuke and other formats are so important <coughs> is to teach us a little bit more of that gumption, um, to be ahead of our skis in crazy ideas for NATO. Because being really solid is essential, but being really solid uh, doesn't necessarily work looking forward as much as we'd love it for it to do so. So that's, I think, that desire for greater to have someone in the room who will give us a little bit of a different feeling and a little bit of a different style um, to keep us being in an advantage that we certainly want to have. And I should drink some water. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you all for these rich answers. Uh, we can continue with the Q&A. Sean. visiting fellow here, uh, aka Mr. Jeff, apparently. <laughs> Thanks for the shout out. Um, actually, more timely than you could know because I just uh, published a piece on oh, the Jeff yeah. and the Jeff's role in countering hybrid threats. Uh, Sorry. Nick wants you to see my, my red trousers <laughs> as I'm standing up. Uh, uh, it's just been published during this panel, so uh, how's about that? Hot off the press. <laughs> uh, the question's not about the Jeff, it's about the Washington summit. Uh, it's going to be such a big deal, it's already looming large on our collective horizon. Uh, the panel's covered a lot of ground, but let me challenge you. What, what's the one thing, the one takeaway that the Biden administration and NATO allies should be thinking about fr from Washington? And let me help a little bit. The previous two summits, I think the big takeaway in Madrid was that Russia is the main adversary and NATO is back to collective defense and deterrence. And in Vilnius, it was that Ukraine has a, has a viable So Russia, Ukraine, what's the next stage in the, in the story of NATO summits? Thanks. Maybe if I can start off, I would say the, the very unsexy uh, answer to that is that we have to deliver, right? So we have to deliver on the 2% commitments, we have to deliver on the capability developments, 
We have to deliver on the executability of the plans and the force posture and the ready forces. We have to deliver on the nuclear adaptation uh, and coherence between nuclear and conventional capabilities. We have to deliver. We've made, as you point out, a lot of good commitments uh, and done a lot of great thinking, um, but now it's time to literally put them, our money where our mouths are. Uh, and I think, you know, certainly from within NATO and from within headquarters, that is, that is our primary focus, is making sure that we are delivering on all of the commitments that our leadership has made over the last two years. Um, so that when we walk out of the, you know, giant conference room in Washington next July, uh, that we can say NATO is fit for purpose, that we have the forces capabilities and plans in place uh, to be able to meet uh, the strategic challenges that we face um, right now against Russia, against uh, the threat of terrorism, uh, and we're looking to the future. Um, so I will say, first off, you're welcome, Sean, for setting you up to so announce your publication. Uh, that was not planned. Um, so I will say, and I don't think this will be surprising given sort of my opening remarks, but I think delivery is, is key, as Jessica just said. I will point out, I think really like the narrative around delivery is really hard to communicate to a public. And so thinking really deeply, one, you have to act, first you have to deliver, but second, communicating that delivery is I think something we need to put a lot of effort into because that's a hard thing to really message out. So. I will offer another message that could be pointed out, which is that NATO is preparing for the future. NATO will be here for another 75 years. We're really moving into the next era. I think that would be a really strong message, a one that I think is a little easier for broader publics to digest. But again, to Jessica's point, it's got to have meat behind it. So I don't want to repeat myself, but I can't overemphasize the extent to which this summit will take place in a domestic political, under a domestic political microscope with a megaphone, and there are going to be two competing political narratives. Uh, the first one coming from the administration is that NATO remains the indispensable alliance. It's fundamental to American security interest. This president has united NATO in a way that's extraordinary and that and the threats remain clear and present because the war in Ukraine is unresolved. What the other narrative is, there's a big question mark, and that in itself is concerning. Uh, I don't think that the other narrative is going to be it's time to withdraw from NATO because it's obsolete. Uh, the Republican Party, within its own ranks, is going to have to decide, just as it has to decide now where it stands on aid to Ukraine, where, it, where the center of gravity is on this. But it's entirely possible that the narrative come next July, the counter narrative to the administration narrative is going to be that NATO is um, useful, but not uh, certainly not a key priority, that we have other priorities, whether that's the southern border or China or a wider war in the Middle East. And uh, NATO needs to be rethought, or at least our presence um, in the alliance needs to be rethought and perhaps retrenched back to offshore balancing with a nuclear shield and some deployable forces, but it's time for Europe to, to deliver, or we've waited too long for Europe to deliver, so we've given up on that. And, and that's where the media is going to be reading everything that happens down the road here at the site where NATO was born. They're going to be reporting this summit through the prism of the political debate that's informing the presidential campaigns on both sides leading to November. And I will step in there. I think that what's important for NATO to say is that NATO has your back, right? Like for Americans and for Europeans, and this is the delivery piece. And I think we can often say, oh, the, a lot of the NATO debates or European security debates are very far off. But something from from citizens and you could polling and say yes generally people support you know political divides and so forth but there's an anecdote when um the u.s is not unaccustomed to violence domestically and when there was a an attack at a grocery store in buffalo new york last year one of the observers saw someone in camo come in and you know commit a mass shooting uh and the first thought of this person watching it was like oh is it the russians and they're talking about a grocery store like in Buffalo shortly after the invasion uh, of last year. So Americans, they think about 
the fact that there is actual vulnerability. They do think about security. So, and the world seems ever more scary. So how, NATO is an answer to that scary. NATO is this, this group of your friends, but the narrative that I'm concerned about on the far right is this notion of handouts, right? That these, so the, the scariest thing is a bunch of Europeans coming here with, you know, with like empty plates asking for their, for, for their annual handout from the United States. And I can see that being portrayed that way very easily. So what is on that plate that the Europeans are bringing here? So if you think about um, Madrid summit as a political commitment and you think of um, Vilnius as the plans and the blueprints, like you have to have some, you need to bring things. You have, like, you have to literally bring it, you need to come packing, but don't, not that literally, don't do that literally. But you know, like uh, you need to have here is what you're procuring in weapon systems, here is what you are spending, here is how you are working together with others to do it, here is your actual investment or your receipt of purchase for getting there, right? Uh, and this is how it helps the people and that story of here is what and why it matters for, to have purchased by next summer is that something that is on order or something that is purchased was made someplace by people. And drawing that back, and that's what Biden's speech last week was uh, all about too, was like making that link from, A, NATO will protect you because the world's scary. Uh, NATO is a place where our friends come together to protect us, and they did. Uh, and you take it back to the, the unpopular, but incredibly meaningful in, in, in the European allies too, of the Middle Eastern wars that the US fought and allies showed up for. And then you have the, um, and this helps your community, and here's what I have purchased, and here's how much it cost, and here's where that money is going, and here is why this matters to you. And so I think that that concreteness of delivery, right? Delivery, yes, but it's about people in a place, and it's about friends who have died for you and fought with you. It is not abstract. It is not an Excel spreadsheet. It's not 1.7 versus 2.3 or whatever. Um, it is real stuff and real people in a real place. Um, and if that can come through next summer, I think we'll be okay. But I think it's going to take a tremendous amount of work and the actual purchases and the receipts and not an intention by 2030 something um, to pay an abstract number, but it's real, right? And that really needs to happen or else uh, things can get really scary. I, I wanna quickly touch on just the, the theme that I'm hearing across all four of your remarks is that it's one thing to physically deliver, but it's another thing to, and another thing in its messaging. Another thing in messaging, its execution for portraying not just to the, the national security apparatus, the experts, but also just the common citizen in Buffalo, New York, of understanding this is what the alliance is, this is what we're actually doing, and this is why you should care. Um, so I'm, I'm eager to see how the messaging will change in the next year because the messaging at Vilnius was not the best, as we all know. Um, I think we have time for one, one or two more questions. I'm a Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst, and a former diplomat. I'm feeling the need for a major surge in Arctic operations, and I'm sure as hell I'm not seeing it. And I'm wondering if the problem is money exclusively, or will, or just simple myopia. Your thoughts, guys. So I, I think that there is, there is a, there is an ever-growing acknowledgement of the importance of this area. There's an ever, uh, like, we're, we're like pre-Madrid in terms of words. Like, we have a thought that this is going to be important. We have the understanding that it is. But there are, I think there's an inevitability of the incredibly, you know, the, the impending massive importance of this region. And so when we think about, you know, how, how is the United States vulnerable, you know, in the most physical, you know, Physically, it's quite vulnerable if you go north, right? Like there, there, there's, um, it's close, right? Uh, the, the adversaries and the climate change is making them closer, right? Uh, in many ways. And then you have the, um, the Russia-China dynamics that are yet to play out in the Arctic, right? So we are looking at where we're looking right now. Um, but what is part 
of the Russia and Chinese friendship in the future. Cola, you know, somewhat untouched in terms of like the really important sexy stuff up there, humans touched, but like expensive stuff, not touched. I think we have a lot to worry about um, in, the, in the high north, in the Arctic, in the future, but we have more friends to do it with, right? So I think with the Finns and with the Swedes coming in, in and coming in, um, I think we have a lot more knowledge, a lot more capabilities, and how do we look at this area that is next? I think it is really hard when we're looking at three different theaters at the moment to be to think about the relation of yet something on top of all of it. Uh, but I think we are going to have to, but it's expensive and it's uncomfortable um, and unfamiliar for many allies. So how do we see leadership for uh, the Arctic allies on this issue? How do we speed up activity? I think these are all really hard questions and important questions. And um, I'm not sure how much time the world will give us to think about them <coughs> greatly. But yeah, so the, the, the US is thinking about implementation. Yes. So we now we have, we're thinking about beyond strategies to implementation. That's, it's good to think about implementation, um, but we need to implement. Right, and then we and we need to accelerate, and those are words that are, I think are much harder to fund and to do. I also think we have uh, some unfamiliarity, um, some discomfort, and a lack of vision of what operations the Arctic really look like. First off, what are the actual threats? I don't think we actually know truly really what the threats would be facing are. I'm not sure we have a good sense of what it is we'd want to influence, even if it weren't a defense mission, but a shaping mission. Um, and we, you know, it's not really a comfort place for anybody. I also think we have a problem that there are sort of two visions of what the Arctic is. And when we say Arctic missions, I think we in the United States and Canada think our north. And if you talk to European colleagues, particularly the Nordics, they think they're north. And those are two, you know, connected, but sort of distinct areas. And so I think we have a problem of competing visions or at least a lack of clarity about what we're talking about. That being said, I mean, we have seen some progress and you probably know this as well as we do, right? Um, you know, the Nor Norfolk JFC really is going to have um, what's is fully manned, but is already sort of taking responsibility for the high north. Uh, you get exercises and training in Norway with a significant United States and UK presence in particular. I have heard talk about a freedom of navigation operation, perhaps sort of testing new Russian legal claims around the northern sea route. So there are is movements, um, but I will say I agree. It's an area ripe for uh, movement and for good thinking. And so hopefully people like you are working on this. I know I've spent some time thinking about this, but you know it, the, it's not totally optimistic, but it's not totally pessimistic either, right? There has been self movement, but there can certainly be more. Would be what I would say. So I think there there are two key issues. It's a great question. Uh, as an Air Force officer, I was stationed north of the Arctic Circle for over a year, commanding uh, Air Force units across Greenland. So I, I feel like I've had a focus at least on <laughs> yeah. the north since the early 1970s. But the first issue is, I think we're a bit conflicted as to whether we still have hope that the Arctic can be a zone of cooperation as opposed to a zone of confrontation. And that sort of plays out in the, the whole diplomatic question of how we regard the, the Arctic Council and our participation in it. And then the second is, is whether NATO itself, in terms of command structure and organization, decides to prioritize deterrence and defense in the Arctic. And we're at a real inflection point here with Finland and Sweden coming in. And it's one reason why I feel so strongly that we need to create a, a distinct Nordic command, because we know the Norwegians and the Danes will, are already running ahead to try to increase force presence in the Arctic. But there's a real opportunity here. So to take Finland and Sweden and put them under Brunson and orient them towards the east from the Polish border, I think it's a missed opportunity in terms of the challenges we face in the Arctic. Not that that decision's been taken, but, but I hope they get the decision right. If I could maybe just add on to that. Um, so I think the, the general feeling is, and, and we're of course waiting for Sakir's um, final recommendations on the new NATO command structure, which will be delivered uh, also in the Washington summit. But I think there's a pretty strong consensus that the, the Nordic countries are going to have to stay together and that, that JFC Norfolk will be the focal point for um, Arctic thinking. Um, but, you know, the Arctic is not an area that is unfamiliar to, uh, to NATO or to allies, right? Who is actually more prepared 
uh, to work with Finland and, and soon Sweden to address, to better address the security concerns in the region as an alliance. Um, and of course, you know, for those of us who think about the strategic deterrence uh, and nuclear forces of Russia, the Kola Peninsula and the high north is of critical importance. And, and so we're going to have to think about um, you know, the, the strategic competition that is clearly developing in the high north. We're going to think both how to, how to manage escalation dynamics that are going to, that are going to come to the fore, um, particularly, you know, because we do now have a quite a large border, a uh, land border between Finland and, uh, and Russia that is, you know, part of our, our NATO strategic thinking. And so, you know, these are all, um, elements and, and an adaptations that are being thought through right now um, with the ascension of Finland and soon to be a session of Sweden about how we're incorporating all this thinking into our into our planning and force structure. But I think the good news is, is that we have now and are soon will have the countries that are most capable uh, of thinking about those risks uh, and, and what we need to do as an alliance to successfully deter uh, and compete with Russia in the high north inside of NATO. Um, and we will and already are relying quite a bit on certainly um, Finnish expertise and Swedish expertise uh, as we're thinking through all of these uh, various scenarios and, and, and having both Finland and Sweden as part of uh, NATO is just going to be tremendous value and benefit uh, to the alliance as we're thinking through how we deter and defend the, um, you know, this kind of broader geographical footprint. But, but it's, not, it's not something that we haven't thought about before and, and didn't know that it was an important region. We, the Arctic has always been part of our calculus. But, but I do think that with the climate change, um, and with the um, you know, northern sea route opening up, potentially, you know, this is an area where we are going to, that is going to be um, contested by Russia increasingly, and they're going to contest uh, and certainly push back on our ability to operate uh, there and, you know, their, their whole concept uh, for defending the high north is to, is to constrain our uh, our ability to act in the region. So, so I think there's obviously work to be done, but I think we're incredibly well positioned now as an alliance with Finland and Sweden as part of our, as part of the alliance to be able to do that work and do it effectively. And that's both from a capability standpoint, I'll just point out a capability standpoint, a defense industry standpoint, I'm thinking about the Finnish uh, icebreaker capacity here. Uh, the capability side, Sweden in particular has high experience, high knowledge of operating not only in the high north, but operating in the high north in pretty desolate, low infrastructure conditions. And so borrowing on those capabilities on the defense uh, industry and on the sort of analytical power that's built into the Arctic in these countries, I think is be really key for the Alliance once they're both members. Well, thank you all. Um, I, again, thank you, Jessica, for, for joining us from Brussels. Uh, virtually here at CSIS, and I want to say a massive thank you to you three for joining me today. And also a thank you to everyone for joining us both online and in person. Uh, please join me in uh, saying thank you to them. Thank you.
Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Just yeah. No, yeah. it's exciting yeah. because um, the building of the coalition is exciting. Yeah. I think that's what? Yeah. The top is that? Friction. I know. And, Just don't uh, do what the Germans did. Like, create a coalition that was... But that will be so. Yeah, completely inoperable. Yeah. That will be so yeah. in many areas that there will be, you know, positions okay. that are... Okay, okay, so we, I think we can... Uh, get going with uh, our second panel uh, today. Uh, I'm Daniel Fiat uh, from, from CSDS. Um, it's a real pleasure to uh, serve as the moderator for this second panel. Uh, before we jump into the substance and introductions, um, let me again thank um, our partner CSIS, um, and Max and CC in particular for, for helping us with this, uh, with this conference. Um, the first panel was excellent, by the way. Uh, and let us um, also acknowledge the support um, from NATO Public uh, Diplomacy Division as well in the support of this uh, second event, the first one being held in June, uh, and uh, we're all here today. Um, so with those words of uh, thanks um, uh, done, I think in this panel, and also listening to some of the direction of the conversation in, in the first panel as well, uh, what we'd like to try and do is, is potentially build on some of the uh, questions uh, that were raised. Um, and this um, panel in particular, uh, we're going to try and focus a bit more on uh, the question of what Europeans should do. And I think um, actually Bob Bell put it quite succinctly in his um, presentation, or at least posing the question of whether or not Europeans were really all in uh, in the game or the question on questions of deterrence and defense. So, I think one of the first things we'd like to get from this session is firstly a flavor of where Europeans are in the debate about de deterrence and defense. That's the first question. Um, and linked to that, of course, is yes, a discussion about defense spending. We all, we all know that very well about how much more Europeans have to spend. But I think also in this panel, we will try and um, address the spending question, but also maybe go beyond it a bit more in terms of uh, what more European, Europeans can do in a, in a wider spectrum. And I think also it was very interesting in the first panel listening uh, to the interface or interplay between conventional and non-conventional or below the threshold uh, um, areas of security that Europeans also have to uh, think about. So yes, if Europeans have to do more uh, for their responsibility, what does that really mean uh, uh, in practice as well? And then finally, another point that I think we'll come to, and one of the reasons why we're here as well, is to also anticipate a little bit uh, the discussions that will lead into the Washington summit. So we have a bit of time, of course, uh, but I also want to pick up on what uh, Max said uh, right at the beginning in his introductory remarks, which is, how do we go beyond this just being a kind of um, big party? Huh? So what does life look like um, the day after the Washington summit in terms of where Europeans in particular are expected to continue um, taking up their responsibility? And, and I use that word responsibility um, not lightly uh, because I also want to connect with one of the other issues that was um, raised in the first panel. Uh, and that is about the political horizon uh, that we can see before us. Europe, Europeans, of course, are concentrating quite a lot on uh, the war in Ukraine. There are also a number of other crises in the neighborhood um, that need addressing in one way uh, or the other. But I guess the longer term discussion as well is how um, politics are shaping up in, in Washington, in the US. But let's also think a little bit about potential disturbances in the European uh, body politic. We have European elections coming up uh, quite soon, which may potentially radically uh, shift up the political attention, at least on the European Union side. Uh, so I think we have quite a full plate um, uh, to get through uh, uh, in this session. And let me briefly introduce each of our excellent speakers who are going to take us through uh, this discussion. The first speaker on my list, Max Bergman, doesn't need any introduction. Thanks for in, uh, welcoming us into your home. Um, uh, and great to be working with you again, Max, uh, on this and looking very much forward to, to hearing your views. Uh, second on my list uh, is Justina Gotowska. Welcome, Justina. Uh, thanks for being with us. You're the Deputy Director of the Center for Eastern uh, Studies, or OSW, if that's the correct uh, uh, acronym to use. Thanks for being with us. Uh, third on my list is a very dear colleague, uh, Alexander Matala, uh, who's a professor at CSDS, the Brussels School of Governance, uh, the Freie University, 
uh, of Brussels, um, and you're also a senior research fellow as well at the um, Egmont Institute in Brussels, which is also a well-known um, Belgian think tank. And then last but certainly not least to my immediate left uh, is Gesine Weber, uh, who is a researcher at the German Marshall Fund uh, of the US. And all four of these speakers, um, I'll do the promotion on behalf of them, you should definitely read uh, what they've published uh, in, in the last few weeks and months, uh, a, a fountain of knowledge, each of them. Um, and let me get the debate underway by, by first coming um, to you, Max, if, if I can. And, and coming back to this question about um, this you know, European responsibility in the context of transatlantic uh, security. I'd, I'd like to get a, a sense from you maybe how US expectations have evolved since the war. Um, do the, what have the Americans learned from how Europeans have reacted uh, during the, the war on Ukraine? Does that raise expectations? Does that raise certain uh, challenges or problems of perspective when looking at the Europeans? So I'd really like to hand over to you and uh, dig deep with that first question. Great. Well, thank you, Daniel, and thank you all for being here. So I think American perceptions of Europe have evolved and have uh, improved, but I think it started from an incredibly low base. I think the <laughs> overall American assumption is that basically the Europeans were deadbeats, that uh, America did everything for their security, and you know, and I think Americans would, would travel to Europe, would, would go to especially Western European capitals and say, my God, you know, this is you know, wealthy, you know, wealthy countries, uh, and yet not quite understand why Europeans uh, then contributed uh, so little to American war efforts, whether that was in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I, I'm well aware that NATO was there. Uh, in, in Afghanistan, but I think the broader conception was just the Europeans refused to, to spend. Um, and I think that's been impacted by the war. Uh, and I think the expectations for how Europe would react before the war happened uh, were incredibly low. I think folks in the White House, when they were uh, thinking about their sanctions packages, uh, were, were sort of baking in that Europeans would be resident, uh, uh, hesitant to do anything. Uh, thinking back to 2014 when in, in the wake of Russia's uh, seizure of Crimea that the EU reaction was, was fairly tepid. It wasn't until MH17 was really shot down that summer where suddenly then there was a stronger European sanctions response. Uh, and I think Americans, I think policymakers in, in Washington were really shocked at how strong the European response was. Uh, and then, but I think that concern about how Europe would react you know, if you look at the summer of 2022, everyone was fretting about, well, what happens when, uh, you know, Russia cuts off the gas? Lo well, and behold, uh, Nord Stream 1 and 2 pipelines explode that fall. Um, and I have to say, in one of the few op-eds that I think I've written that was particularly on the nose, most of them are sort of wide off the mark, but this one said, we don't need to worry about Europe's commitment to this conflict. That the European body politic has shifted. They have seen a war in Europe and have reacted very strongly. And I think what, what Americans have, have taken notice of what Europeans have done, whether it's the UK leading and providing weapon systems before uh, the United States in, in, in storm shadow and, and, uh, and long range missiles and tanks and other things like that. Uh, whether it's the amount of equipment that has been provided, the German Zeitenwende, uh, I think has, people have, have stood up and taken notice. And I would also say, I think there's an element of the European Union here where stepping up and spending on behalf of the EU to backfill countries that have been giving equipment uh, to Ukraine through the European Peace Facility. Well, I don't think Americans could, could articulate what the European Peace Facility is. <laughs> I think there's a recognition that the EU, that Europe has done, has, has stood up and and respond, and I think you see that in, in Mitch McConnell uh, in his recent statements about how much Europe has stepped up. Now that said, I think you know the first panel I think really hit on something that the narrative that will come out in the Washington summit is I think uh, the, the 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 narrative conflict will be on the one hand I think the president will be saying America is back, Europe is stronger than ever. NATO has found its raison d'etre. NATO is going to be at 32. Hope, you know, Sweden, hopefully any minute, any, any day, any week, any month, will we'll make it uh, 32 uh, NATO members. There'll be a lot to celebrate. But there will still be 
you know, us pointing to the Wales pledge and and saying that, well, you know, how right now I think it's 11 countries are hitting uh, the two percent goal. That Europeans still aren't doing enough. Uh, and and I think as much as we want to sort of dismiss the kind of Trumpian narrative about NATO, I think it's worth taking it some ways very seriously. Because there is an element of, of accuracy and truth there where, and I think the, uh, and what I mean by that is that Europe has been reliant on the United States for its security. In some ways, the United States actually really likes this and enjoys this as much as we complain about it. Many of us that work on Europe policy love the fact that we get to call the shots, that it's, you know, U.S. NATO, State Department, Defense Department, SACCURE is American, that we are the ones that Europeans look to. On the other hand, general generalists that focus on U.S. policy do not understand the current setup and say, why is it this way? We have a, a, a peer rival in China and we are babying the Europeans when it comes to handling their security. And there's real tension, I think, within the U.S. government about this. But the, the, the narrative that it, we need to be Asia first and Europe doesn't really matter that much to us anymore, I think really holds a lot of water in part because, uh, you know, the Cold War was a long time ago. And in many respects, um, the, the, you know, the president after Biden, whether that's happens in, you know, in a year and a bit or in uh, five years, is not going to be a, a president of the Cold War period uh, and has a different vision and conception of Europe. And in fact, I think increasingly thinks of Europe as Europe, not as just this collection of assembly of, of different countries. And I think the one thing that I would maybe throw out on the table here is I think when we think about low European defense spending, I think the thing that we have to begin to wrap our heads around is that it's because for many countries in Europe, NATO has solved the problem, that NATO has succeeded, that the threat to the nation for most Europeans is very minimal. Daniel, you live in Belgium. You're in, what is the threat to the Belgium nation? Well, you have a, a counterterrorism threat. You have, I think, policing challenges. They've got to secure the institutions that are there. But the idea that Belgium will be you know, in, invaded is not doesn't feel very real, and hence you have low defense spending. And that's, I think, true for much of Western Europe. In Eastern Europe, you have a different national threat perception. Yet, I think you, what Ukraine has done is awaken Europeans that there is a threat, maybe not to the nation, but to Europe. And so this is where I think there's a fundamental dilemma. That we're asking Europeans to spend at a national level. For, for most Europeans, the threat is not to the nation, but to their Europe. And I think this is, when I look out at NATO, when we think about the Washington summit going forward, um, you know, 75 years, NATO has, ensure, has enabled Europe to exist effectively, to have a unified Europe, which is utterly phenomenal that that uh, has, has occurred. But when, what do we project out when we think about the next 75 years? 75 years from now is a little bit too far in the future maybe, but 50, 25. And what I would say is that there's a fundamental structural dilemma where Europe and through the EU increasingly exists and is increasingly operating as the EU. And Europeans are increasingly thinking about their, their security, about themselves as European. And I think Brexit sort of fully demonstrated that, uh, especially for a younger uh, segment of, 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 of British nationals. So what I see going forward is a Europe that's, co that's becoming closer together. And yet we have the security dimension of Europe being focused on the nation state. Now, this doesn't mean that NATO becomes uh, you know, redundant or irrelevant. But I think what it, needs, what it means is that NATO has to adapt to an evolving Europe. And we tend to think that Europe has been very static and fixed and hasn't really changed because we just look at defense spending numbers and say, man, those Europeans have been deadbeats. But Europe has evolved over the last 20 or 30 years in really dramatic ways, and I think we'll continue to do so. And NATO needs to adapt to that. And I think what we've seen in this conflict is that there is a role for the European Union in leveraging its potential ability to get money. It has its own currency. NATO does not have that. When you have your own currency, you can 
you can do things, <laughs> you can spend money. Uh, and so through the European Peace Facility, I think this is sort of an unleveraged tool that, and why would Europe need to do this? Because no one is spending on European security. The Germans are spending on German security. The French are spending on French security. It is the United States that is spending on European security, providing these en enabling capabilities to, for Europeans to act as Europeans. And those are the sort of things uh, that I think we want Europeans to do, and I see the EU as being a key vehicle to perhaps doing that. And then when we look at the, the major short-term crises that we have of basically there are, there's no ammo in the warehouses in many European countries, well, the EU can leverage funds to help get companies uh, up and running and help integrate the European defense uh, industrial landscape um, by, by leveraging its capital. And this is where I think there's a strong support within Europe when you look at polling. You know, polling is incredibly consistent about the, the strength within Europe, about the, the, the need for greater European cooperation when it comes to defense. And, and I think that is where I would hope that when we look at the Washington Summit that we see the Europeans bringing something to the table where Europe is offering some big proposal, recommendation, a, a funding mechanism that then is coming uh, to sort of support NATO. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Th thanks so much, uh, Max, and also thanks for already taking us past the defense spending um, uh, kind of uh, analysis of, of European efforts and I think you've already outlined very clearly some of the areas where you think Europe is also evolving. I very much also liked how you uh, spoke about NATO adaptation to what Europeans are doing which is not the normal way of, of necessarily thinking about the alliance. So that was very, a very interesting uh, perspective which we can come back to uh, in the, in the Q&A session. Um, Justina, if I come to you now, maybe we can challenge this assumption actually because I, I remember, um, certainly before the invasion, uh, there was not exactly a high degree of unity between Europeans on how far they perceived Russia to be a threat. Um, we've seen also the response in the immediate aftermath of the war, where there has seemed to be certainly a basis for unity amongst the Europeans um, in response to supporting Ukraine. So I guess the first thing I would like to hear from you is, how do you assess how Europeans view the Russia threat and the Ukraine war? And I pose this question because um, in Europe, and I'm not sure if you detect the same thing, but in Europe we tend to look at the US debate and we try to cast on the US debate some degree of maybe fatigue uh, setting in in the political process, but that also assumes somehow that the Europeans are immune to that fatigue. I'm not sure that's the case, but if this is going to be a long war, as many as the panelists in the first panel suggested, how do you see the kind of European, uh, not just unity, but um, support for Ukraine evolving? Uh, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for having me in this panel. And I will try to give you my perspective coming from uh, one of the biggest countries uh, on, on the eastern flank. Um, and uh, I will um, begin uh, by saying that, in my opinion, we have two different readings of the current security situation in Europe, which shapes the, shape uh, the strategies both towards supporting Ukraine and um, adapting own military capabilities. But I will start with a positive um, and uh, agree with, uh, with Max that, on the one hand, a Russian invasion of Ukraine um, has led to substantially changed discourse um, about security and defense in Europe, and that's true. Uh, Russia was named and agreed as the major security threat for European allies, uh, and deterrence and defense was made uh, the priority. Uh, NATO and European allies have uh, strengthened um, uh, collective defense and uh, focused on that in Europe. Uh, there is more um, activity, not only of the US, but European allies on the eastern flank, uh, there is an agreement on uh, regional defense plans and their implementation. There is NATO enlargement in Northern Europe. Um, European allies started to increase uh, defense spending. Uh, EU engaged in financing military deliveries to Ukraine and in training uh, Ukrainian soldiers. Um, so all this strengthens um, deterrence and defense, show uh, allied unity. Uh, but I think that behind that, we still have different readings of where we are and how we perceive the threat. 
And uh, this is very, in my opinion, this is the key uh, which uh, all the um, divisions and frictions uh, will that we have, we, we are having behind the scenes now are coming from, and that we will have uh, also uh, also in the future. So the first reading, uh, the one that uh, is on the uh, is present on the eastern flank and shared, shared by the majority of the eastern flank countries, is that the long term of uh, uh, long term goal of Russia is to undermine European security order uh, uh, by fully subordinating Ukraine, undermining sovereignty of the Central uh, Europe, uh, under mining NATO and the EU. And these strategic goals Russia, uh, Russia presented in December 2021. And in our opinion, uh, irrespectively of whether some see Russia as stuck in Ukraine and as currently weak politically, economically, militarily, Moscow believes it has the perseverance to achieve its objectives as it sees a global shift coming um, in which it will be possible, together with China, to undermine US-led alliances and regional uh, security orders both in Europe and in, in the Indo-Pacific. So the strategy in this reading uh, should be that Europe needs to be prepared for long-term strategic competition with Russia. Uh, we cannot deny what Russian goals are, and we cannot delude ourselves that we will come to some kind of negotiated settlement over Ukraine and U uh, European security. And hence on Ukraine, uh, we should invite the country to NATO, even if we don't know when and on what conditions and in which circumstances it will join the alliance. We should prepare for long-term support for Ukraine in terms of arms production, and we should give also the Ukrainians qualitatively advanced uh, weapons uh, to be able to strike Russian uh, rear uh, of the front. Um, Within NATO, we should be serious about the defense of NATO territory and include not only hybrid but also conventional Russian armed attack on NATO on allies in our worst case scenarios and be ready to repel such aggression. And as I've said, this is the, the thinking shared by the majority of the eastern uh, flank countries. Uh, the majority uh, understands the stake in Ukraine and undertook huge efforts uh, from the very beginning to support uh, Ukraine militarily. And I think even there you have, uh, you have noticed the difference, how much engaged in the first months of war Poland, Czechia, Slovakia were sending tanks already heavy, heavy weaponry when this was not the consensus in Western Europe. And I think due to this effort, Ukraine survived, Ukraine maintained itself. And then uh, this time which uh, allowed uh, Western Europeans to, uh, to think uh, through their uh, uh, strategy towards Ukraine. And then now we have uh, them, Germany, French and, uh, France and others uh, uh, putting, um, uh, increasing uh, the deliveries. So now the f focus of the Eastern flank countries is on replenishing arms and equipment, strengthening own military capabilities and increasing the armed forces as quickly as possible. Because the understanding is that Russia might rebuild its uh, military capabilities much and reconstitute much quicker than the West uh, um, in general um, anticipate. And hence we have 3% of GDP for uh, defense spending in the majority of the Eastern flank countries with Poland um, uh, spending 3.9% uh, um, uh, this year. It's uh, first on, on the NATO, uh, NATO list now. Um, and uh, the pressure from the eastern flank countries to implement the regional defense planning within NATO to the fullest. And, but then we have the second reading of the situation uh, where uh, there is an acknowledgement in Western Europe that uh, of the Russian strategic goals vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Um, I think no one questions that, but I think that people don't believe that these Russian goals are feasible and uh, uh, that uh, there is a belief that Russia is simply too weak and will not confront NATO directly in the future. Um, so we have, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine, we have uh, um, a, a rather a careful um, conflict, strategy of conflict management uh, that includes self-deterrence um, from uh, earlier and much more substantial help uh, uh, to Ukraine uh, due to uh, Russian uh, nuclear pre pressure. Uh, and I think that the strategy, as, uh, as I understand discussions in Western Europe, is that the time will come when Russia will be willing to strike a deal on Ukraine and on uh, European security. 
and we will, see, will achieve then some state of equilibrium in European security. And uh, then, in such a situation, Ukraine's uh, NATO membership will be a bargaining chip um, in these negotiations, and it will be rather unlikely that the country will join NATO. Um, and uh, with regard to NATO's deterrence and defense, I have the impression people don't believe that we'll, uh, worst case scenarios uh, uh, will materialize. Um, that uh, Russia is able and politically willing, military able to go against NATO countries. Uh, but at the same time, I think that there is a conviction that uh, deterrence and defense need to be increased, uh, but not to the extent that Eastern flank countries think it is, uh, it is necessary. Um, and above that, I think there is an assumption that we might come back to arms control with Russia someday, cooperation with the OSCE, and maybe even a partial revival of NATO-Russia founding act. We discussed that uh, in, the, in the previous panel. And hence, the 2% uh, of GDP for defense spending is uh, being questioned. We see the debates in Germany. Uh, we see econ economic problems, other priorities that are coming in, social and societal debate that are uh, people, uh, West European society, uh, societies that are wary of the war uh, and uh, would like to see uh, peace negotiations coming. And all that, uh, uh, that uh, influences uh, also the uh, political decisions. So uh, there is also, uh, um, uh, co comparing to Eastern flank countries in Western Europe, I think there is um, uh, no notion of necessity to quickly uh, develop and invest in military capabilities because there is this belief that uh, Russia will need uh, years to reconstitute this itself. And um, from our perspective, uh, this is problematic and puts us um, uh, before d difficult <laughs> uh, questions on how to, uh, how to develop military cooperation and how to increase deterrence and defense uh, uh, in the region. And uh, I think for now, I, I stop here. Yeah, thanks so much, Justine, and also for uh, maybe giving us a bit more of an indication of what the Russians, are, how they're reacting to our own dynamics as well, which, as you said, in, in terms of the discussions about potential arms control, uh, peace negotiations, uh, Russia, in a way, biding its time for certain political dynamics to maybe unfold, mm. um, is, is one of the dimensions which I think gets lost maybe also in the... Uh, European discussion. So thanks so much for, uh, for raising that um, uh, in this panel. And um, Alexander, I want to turn to you because um, the word deterrence was used. Uh, we have been using the word deterrence uh, uh, on a few occasions already. And I think also in the uh, first panel, a um, uh, few of the speakers also referred to some of the um, capability gaps um, that, that uh, NATO uh, faces in the European theater. Uh, and that was also fleshed out in terms of both conventional uh, means, but also non-conventional uh, 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 deterrence means as well. So I want to come to you um, and get, first of all, an understanding of how you see European allies having adapted to um, NATO's core mission. It sounds odd to say adapting back to NATO's core mission, but there certainly has had to be a certain degree of um, mental adaptation before any discussion about investments, capabilities, etc. Uh, and how do you see that shaping up over the, over the longer term? Because it seems to me from what we've heard also in panel one and, and so far, that one of the big enemies that we face is also time. <laughs> you know, the lack of time sometimes, or even the, the way in which political dynamics may unfold over a number of months. So how do we make sure that uh, European allies in particular are making the right types of investments, right types of decisions uh, on deterrence and defense, please? Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, let me also uh, thank you as well as Max uh, for putting this great program together uh, and, uh, and also say to uh, the, uh, the back office teams at CSIS and CSDS a big thank you for making, making everything happen. Um, uh, turning to your question, Daniel, um, I think the, the big picture um, fact that is staring us in the face is that nuclear deterrence has come back in a big way and it is prompting us uh, to take a hard look at what is called in NATO parlance the appropriate mix between uh, conventional nuclear and missile defense uh, capabilities. 
um, precisely because uh, we have really been focusing on the conventional part over the past uh, nine years. Um, and the other two legs are, to uh, a considerable extent, lagging behind in, uh, in time. So what I want to do in, in my remarks is first zoom in on uh, the, uh, the evolving uh, Russian threat and the nuclear uh, threat coming from the Russian Federation and then turn to how that uh, affects the discussion on, on the appropriate mix. Now, you will all recall that when um, President Putin um, launched uh, the so-called special uh, military operation in the spring of um, 2022, uh, it was preceded and immediately followed by nuclear signaling, uh, the, uh, the Sarmat test uh, putting um, um, uh, Russia's strategic forces on a special combat duty uh, uh, regime. Um, and that was uh, presumably meant to, uh, to intimidate Kiev, uh, to dissuade against external intervention, and it did not really work. But at the same time, it probably did instill a much greater sense of caution, of caution than would otherwise have, have been the case. Um, and, and that pattern of, of nuclear saber rattling also continued uh, in uh, the course of the year. It reached a second peak uh, in, the, in the August, September uh, period uh, of, of last year. Uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, uh, in his annexation uh, speech of the, uh, the new Russian provinces, um, promised to defend uh, the, uh, the, Russian, um, uh, uh, the Russian territory with all possible means. Uh, and this is not a bluff, uh, remember? Um, in parallel, really in the same time frame, um, growing concern about Russian uh, nuclear use in Ukraine prompted the United States and, uh, and some allies to explicitly warn R Russia that uh, such uh, nuclear use um, would, uh, would entail, in the words of Jake Sullivan, catastrophic consequences for Russia. That was high stakes uh, nuclear signaling uh, going on. And although that has sort of um, moved a bit into the background uh, in the past year, it is good to bear in mind this may well return, especially if or when Ukrainian forces um, succeed uh, on the battlefield in terms of uh, reclaiming um, uh, now occupied territories. Uh, and even if it doesn't immediately return, that signaling that has occurred has really put the limelight on the fact that Russia disposes of a great variety of escalatory options that provided with um, the means to completely and dramatically overturn conventional battlefield outcomes. And that is really, uh, in my view, uh, driving the whole um, appropriate mix discussion because if we also look at how the Russian threat evolves, its land forces uh, have now to a considerable extent suffered combat attrition, but that is much less the case for its air force, uh, for, its uh, for its navy, and its, its nuclear arsenal remains intact. And as a consequence, uh, uh, nuclear escalation dynamics also constitute uh, the, uh, the one big um, area of competitive advantage that the Russian Federation still, uh, still holds. So uh, on to the, the appropriate mix uh, discussion. And uh, the appropriate mix language has, of course, been recodified in the, uh, the strategic concept uh, uh, agreed at the, the Madrid uh, summit, um, stating that uh, NATO's deterrence, uh, appropriate mix, conventional nuclear uh, missile defense uh, and space uh, and, and cyberspace and so on. Huh? Now, if we zoom out, NATO's adaptation since 2014, since Crimea, has really uh, dealt primarily with the conventional leg. Huh? The conventional uh, force adaptation started uh, from the whale summit. It's dramatically accelerated um, uh, at Madrid. Uh, defend every inch, uh, draw up the new regional defense plans um, that have now been uh, approved uh, at, at Vilnius. 
So the military planners have done all the data crunching on the conventional uh, deterrence and defense part of the story. They know what capabilities are needed. That can now be apportioned uh, to um, nations through uh, the defense uh, planning cycle. And that channels uh, and gives purpose to the, the defense investments that uh, NATO allies uh, and the European allies in particular, they are making it. And I know that uh, some nations are still seen as, as laggards uh, because of uh, the, the 2%, etc. But let me invite you to pay attention to what's going on in real terms in the defense budgets of actual ally, individual allies. They're being doubled, tripled, quadrupled in some cases, especially if you also take into account uh, what is still to come in the years ahead, but that is really already locked in in terms of uh, acquisition um, cycles. So um, even though I, I, I will readily admit uh, more is needed, that effort needs to be sustained, but I'm actually pretty confident that um, over, uh, over the years we will see much more capable uh, European, um, uh, European militaries uh, in, in the conventional domain. Uh, so that's, that's the good news. Now, unfortunately, uh, let me um, turn to what is, uh, what is still missing, because if you then zoom in on the nuclear part of the story, it didn't really start yet in 2014, but it only took off in 2016 uh, at the Warsaw Summit, uh, very, uh, um, more hesitantly, um, the strategic concept uh, only sort of uh, codified uh, the, the nuclear aki, if you will, and it was only uh, last summer at the Vilnius summit uh, that heads of state and government uh, commissioned um, uh, the updating uh, of, of planning uh, to increase the flexibility and adaptability of NATO's nuclear forces. So while the conventional planning work has really already come full circle. The nuclear planning work is only just starting, and, it, and that is really one of the big deliverables, uh, the initial work uh, for the Washington, the Washington summit. And that is also hitting home uh, in, in different European capitals. I mean, if you uh, take the, uh, the recently released uh, German national security strategy uh, uh, adopted, by um, um, a social democrat-led uh, government involving the Green Party, publicly and strongly reaffirming that uh, NATO's nuclear deterrence is essential to European security, strongly recommitting to the nuclear mission uh, to uh, continuing to fly dual-capable aircraft, etc. So the, the debate is dramatically shifting. And I can tell you also in the, in the Belgian uh, Brussels scene, the, the, the nuclear conversation is also um, changing very, very substantially. But I do think uh, that um, the, the new nuclear conversation that, is, that has started carries very uh, important capability um, implications uh, for two reasons. First, if NATO military authorities are tasked uh, to look at uh, the nuclear posture uh, again, taking into account that the Russian Federation today has an overwhelming advantage in terms of theater level nuclear systems. I think it is quite likely that uh, the analysis that uh, shape will generate uh, will go into the, into the direction that um, NATO's nuclear uh, posture uh, needs to become more robust, more survivable, uh, and more diversified, uh, because it presently relies on a very minimalist um, uh, set of, of capabilities that were really sort of conceptually designed uh, uh, in the 1990, uh, in 1990, 1991. Uh, um, dual capable aircraft plus uh, the, uh, the B-61 60, uh, uh, munitions. Uh, Jessica already uh, referred to that. Uh, so I think we can assume that um, much more um, effort uh, will be needed uh, in, in, in that respect. Uh, and, and second, um, if nuclear planning is being updated, that will also have um, 
major implications uh, for the conventional uh, capability set precisely because uh, it are the same capabilities that underpin and enable the, the nuclear as well as the conventional posture. Uh, and that is why uh, integration of the two domains is, uh, is, is so important. Um, this concerns not just uh, the dual capable aircraft, which are, as the name suggests, dual capable, uh, but of course also the tankers, also the long range precision uh, uh, strike munitions for the suppression of enemy uh, air defenses, uh, all the ground infrastructure, um, uh, the air bases, uh, all that needs to be protected by ground based air defense, defenses and so on and so forth. And that brings me to the, uh, the missile uh, defense part, part of the story, because uh, NATO's integrated air and missile defense, that's really the capability set uh, that, uh, is, um, that is central um, to um, enabling both uh, nuclear and, and conventional deterrence. So it is not a coincidence that we see all this interest uh, going into uh, the European Sky Shield uh, initiative uh, that, that Germany launched and that is gaining a lot of traction, including from my own country. And it is uh, also uh, not because these more Western European countries are um, not concerned about, uh, uh, about invasion, but the fact is they are uh, running a real risk uh, of, of intense bombardment uh, in Article 5 scenarios, um, because uh, the ports of Hamburg, Bremerhaven, Rotterdam, uh, Antwerp, Zeebrugge, that are the key arteries for sustaining uh, the, uh, the forward presence uh, conventional uh, posture. So it is not so, uh, so, uh, so difficult to understand why everyone is now sort of, yeah, we really need to um, uh, get serious on, on missile defense and talking missile defense. There's also the offensive versus uh, defensive uh, a, a approach to that um, because it is much more cost effective to, uh, to shoot the archer uh, than to try to uh, intercept uh, all, all the arrows. Um, and uh, integrated air and missile defense is not just about all countries acquiring uh, interceptors but truly linking up everything in an integrated system. And that is, of course, then a big challenge for uh, um, um, uh, the, uh, the common NATO capabilities, what is currently the AWACS system, the, uh, uh, the next generation successor uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the AWACS uh, fleet, um, all the, uh, uh, the integrated uh, command um, uh, systems that are uh, um, required for that. So I'll, I'll wrap up. The big picture of deterrence thinking is now sort of re-emerging uh, and looking ahead. Uh, what is really critical in my view is uh, accelerating the adaptation, continuing to nurture the cohesion within the alliance, because that is what, what enables all the rest, and to uh, consolidate and confirm the long-term demand signal uh, that is being sent uh, to our defense industrial base. I'll leave it at that and look forward to the questions. Thanks so much, Alexander. That was um, very, very clear. And also thanks for uncovering, I think, uh, another dimension which uh, tends to get lost uh, in the European discussion. But as you rightfully say, it may be in indirect ways is being addressed uh, in, in, the policy, uh, in the policy realm. So th thanks so much for that. And on that, on that question of um, uh, deterrence um, and what it means in a, in a, in a broader sense, um, Gesine, I want, I want to come to you now because I'm going to try and pull some threads together, which was uh, Max's this opening um, points raised about um, how maybe Washington is looking at Europe now, um, which is an interesting way. So the, a role or an increased role for the European Union uh, in, in that interpretation uh, of Europe. And also what we've heard from, uh, from some of the speakers on this panel, but also in the first panel, about also trying to develop um, Europe's ability to withstand um, or be, if you want to use the word resilient, you can, I guess, uh, one of the other buzzwords, of, of how do we improve um, um, resilience and strength below the threshold of, of conventional military uh, uh, deterrence. So I want to give you the opportunity now to outline your views. Yeah, thank you very much, Daniel, and also uh, thanks to you and Max for bringing me here and to my excellent co-speakers for already 
outlining so much of the uh, big picture um, on that topic. So I think this entire question on a European contribution, um, particularly in the realm of um, deterrence, is actually, um, I think, a very salient question. Um, since the beginning of um, Russia's war in Ukraine, I think, um, in general, in the debate, something that we have been hearing all the time is that idea that there has been a clarification. The clarification that NATO is there for deterrence and defense, and that the EU is there for many other things, but deterrence and defense, or particularly deterrence, is something that um, should be in NATO. And this idea has become a bit, I would say, a rule of the thumb um, for um, yeah, thinking about European security and defense. Um, I would, however, also say that um, particularly the argument that um, it is that, you, that the EU should not even think about um, contrib contributing to deterrence um, and defense because anyway they don't have a like European nuclear force or anything. Um, I find that argument um, also often in this debate on strategic autonomy and this entire idea that basically strategic autonomy is dead because Europe doesn't have real deterrence capabilities. But um, to be very frank, I find that that argument um, intellectually a bit lazy um, and I would even say politically lazy as well um, for the simple reasons that um, it sticks a bit to a very, I don't want to say old fashioned, but let's say established definition of um, deterrence, which is deterrence is mostly um, yeah, something that is something extremely military and very much tied to conventional but nuclear um, capacities as well. And I mean, from a European perspective, it's also politically a bit lazy um, because we all remember very well, I think, the debates on collective defense um, that we have had during the first um, or during the Trump administration. So I think there is definitely um, room to think about an EU role um, in deterrence in the um, Euro Atlantic region. And I see different dimensions that um, this debate can take. I mean, first, there is, of course, the very obvious um, dimension of deterring Russia. And um, I mean, in this regard, I think um, there is very little doubt that there needs to be a leading role of NATO in this regard when it comes to how can you effectively deter Russia. And we have already heard here a lot about uh, the capabilities that are being developed or should be developed. Um, further to do that. But I think, again, um, Max also mentioned how Europe has changed and how it is adapting. And I think that the EU already has a lot of good and important um, instruments that can contribute to building, let's say, a European pillar in NATO deterrence, which is, for example, this entire work on using and doing the homework on capabilities, on using the card, the coordinated annual review on defense to really identify the capability gaps and also to identify where can European allies step up or where, they, where do they have to step up um, in terms of nuclear defense and nuclear deterrence to better contribute um, yeah, to strengthening this European pillar in NATO as well. And for that, the EU can really be a great hub for discussions and also really doing all these analysis because there is a reason why there is a thing like a European Defense Agency, so why not use it um, for the mutual benefit. Um, furthermore, I also think um, that particularly with the implementation of the strategic compass, the idea of a rapid deployment capacity, all these questions, or all this is also tied to some extent to deterrence because when you know that you have um, a strong European force that can go somewhere if it has to, that is of course more in the conventional re con uh, realm than in the nuclear one, but um, building this capability not only in terms of buying stuff, but also in being able to do things, um, I think is a very important element of that. Um, and particularly when we think a bit about more about the long term of European security and European security order and potential EU integration as well of Ukraine, that also means that the EU's external border will look quite different. And um, being able to protect European borders and protect EU borders is certainly also a part of um, thinking about an EU role in deterrence. Although, of course, um, I mean, at the moment there is no illusion 
that um, a European nuclear umbrella could replace any kind of um, US nuclear umbrella over Europe in the near future. Um, although, however, on the medium to long term, I think that Europeans should have these conversations and should very openly reflect on how can not only the one EU European country, which is France with nuclear forces, but also how can the UK and France better contribute to doing a European, or to sharing the burden on nuclear defense and nuclear umbrella as the European contributors to that, and potentially also think about how could Germany, uh, which currently has this model of nuclear sharing with the US, develop, for example, a similar model with France, also how could Poland contribute to that. So I think that is not the debate that needs to be, or, or that needs to be held today, but on the medium to long term, um, that is certainly something that is important for Europeans, particularly in light of shifting US priorities um, to Asia or in the Pacific. And um, then, as you already mentioned in the introduction, and I think there is a second dimension to um, deterrence, um, where the EU has an even more important role to play, and that is hybrid threats. Um, because um, when, it, when we look a bit at the institutional structures of how European defense is organized, and at the hybrid threats that Europeans are facing, and here I would think most importantly about things like, for example, foreign interference, but also terrorism, these area or these threats do not purely fall in a thing that, or in the foreign policy domain, but also in what, or under the EU's CSDP, but also under justice and home affairs. Um, we really see this nexus of these two policy areas so that um, basically EU action on these threats should also be conceptualized as a part of CSDP and then also as deterrence, because when you're building a certain set of resilience or a certain threshold of resilience, that also has a, has a component of deterrence in it, I would say, um, particularly when you also think about questions like interference, like cyber capacities and so on, um, there might also be the question, is there something like deterrence by punishment that the EU could do, particularly with the new tools in the strategic compass, on the long term. But then, of course, it's also, again, the strategic um, and political discussion that needs to be held under that um, in how far the EU wants to do that and in how far um, that is not something that policymakers prefer to do in NATO, which, again, is, the, is for me, again, a question of what is happening uh, here in the, in the US in um, yeah, autumn 2024, because we saw in 2016 how the Trump election has fueled the debates on European security and defense and um, also really fueled what has happened. And um, I think this again next year is going to be a very clarifying moment to how much Europeans or EU member states want to do or feel, need, feel that they need to do themselves on um, deterrence. Um, I very quickly close these remarks on an EU role in deterrence. Um, on a look beyond the Euro-Atlantic region because I think um, that is also something that um, will certainly come up in conversations, particularly um, with the US, um, because, I mean, the Indo-Pacific is going to be the major theater of, um, of international security pr pr probably in the next years. And again, there is no illusion no, nowhere in any European country, um, even if it sounds, sometimes looks like that, also not in France, that um, there, is some, there was something like an EU capacity to deter China with its military means. I think Europeans are very realistic about the military role they can play in the Indo-Pacific and that it's not a French or a British or a G German ship or frigate that will deter China from doing anything in the Indo-Pacific. So let's be clear and have that as a baseline hypothesis for discussing a potential EU role for deterrence um, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, however, here again, I think it's very important to um, shift away from that classic um, idea that deterrence is particularly in the military realm, because what we have, I think that if there is one key learning from Russia's war on Ukraine and the European reaction, 
it is that Europe becomes a geopolitical actor when it uses its economic weight and when it basically uses geoeconomics to achieve geopolitical and strategic goals. And I think that is also how deterrence in the Indo-Pacific has to be conceptualized from a European or EU perspective because the EU has a role to play there as an economic actor, be it through its infrastructure projects or also, of course, sheerly through its trade relationships. And um, when we, for example, see um, how much pressure sanctions can put, then a European deterrence or an EU contribution to deterrence in the Indo-Pacific should potentially also be um, the message that it will really, really hurt um, economically if uh, the EU really leverages um, its toolkit in this regard. And um, yeah, I think that's definitely a role that the EU has to play beyond um, traditional deterrence. I think I'll end it here and uh, give it back to you, Daniel. Thanks so much, Gesine. That was, uh, again, a lot of ground covered. Um, thanks for touching on, on hybrid threats, but also at the end um, of, your, of your opening remarks, bringing in the geoeconomic dimension, if I can call it that. Uh, and then also thank you very much for introducing the Indo-Pacific question, which I guess will also feature um, in discussions around the, the Washington summit. And I, I guess we can try and get into that a little bit in the discussion. So thanks, first of all, to each of our speakers for brilliant um, opening remarks. And I want to immediately, if I can, throw open the floor uh, to see if there are any questions. Just as a, a slight warning, I have my own prepared, so if you don't ask, I will. But uh, I already saw a hand in the middle. I think a microphone will, will come to you. Please, just in the middle here. And I guess you're going to be asked to stand up and introduce yourself as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Kiwami Sato from uh, GW, uh, undergrad, uh, undergrad student. Uh, Thank you for a very informative um, the session. And uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, um, regarding um, the strategic autonomy of the Europe. Um, Europe pursued the strategic autonomy, as you mentioned, like um, the, there's a debate that the uh, EU have to establish their own army, etc., uh, etc., et or um, just uh, these days, U European countries increase the defense budget to the uh, 2%. And so on, but simultaneously, um, the European defence heavily rely on the uh, NATO's nuclear uh, deterrence as well. So, how uh, do you think the Europe have to tackle with this contradiction uh, between um, the nuclear and the strategic autonomy, autonomy issues? Th thanks so much. I I'll try and take one or two more if there are. I see Jerome and the gentleman here. So the second row is, is populated. Thank you very much. Uh, Jérôme Legrand, European Parliament Office to the Congress. Um, I have a question. What we see now, it seems that, I mean, all, all regions are being connected. I mean, what you see from the war in, in Ukraine is connection between Russia and DPRK. What you see from the Middle East is also, you know, Russia and Iran, you know, talking uh, more or less discreetly about things. and you know, weapons from uh, Yemen being inter intercepted by the US uh, before they reach uh, 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 Israel, and, and also uh, tensions being raised by the Israeli conflict in, in, in Europe and also in the US. So all this, I mean, it, it, my question is, can we avoid opening up the debate, even the transatlantic defense debate, to other uh, uh, regions and, and to the, the globalization of conflict and, and of tension somehow? Maybe it will also have to affect the, uh, the NATO summit in a way or another, because it can have an influence on public opinions also and the motivation of public opinions. You know, when you think, okay, in Europe we have NATO, so why do we think about it? But it's beyond uh, Europe and the, the threats are coming from, from other regions. So just a, a more geopolitical, or globalized question. Thank you. Great question. Thanks, Jerome. I'd like to come here now if possible. You can. Hi, I'm Joe Ballard. I am uh, the section chief for uh, the European desk at the uh, Pentagon for the U.S. Navy. Uh, and it kind of in the vein of that same thought process there. We've talked about nuclear deterrence and we've talked about strategic competition and 
the European threats that they may see from Russia, but what about these threats of these small wars and wars on the periphery? Uh, there's been lots of talk about what capabilities European allies bring, um, but we've already seen that these technological panaceas like unmanned systems or nuclear deterrence really aren't playing as such a big role uh, because you look at the uh, Israeli conflict right now or in Ukraine, it's going back to the basics of ground forces. Uh, it's urban warfare. It's all these things that aren't going away and aren't being changed even though the technology is being used. So what I see here is uh, in places where you have the Middle East conflict coming back, Ukraine, conflicts in Africa, um, how these play out strategic competition and not looking necessarily at nuclear deterrence or high-tech uh, responses, but just going back to the basics of these ground war conflicts. Thanks. Thanks so much. That's a really great question. And in fact, also echoes the question that I was going to ask maybe a bit more bluntly uh, of each of you, which is, um, when we say NATO returning to its core tasks, or when we think about the European Union uh, as a security and defense actor, um, a part of that for NATO is out of area operations, and we just heard that this morning actually in the first panel. Uh, but when you think of the EU, and Kazin, you mentioned CSDP, uh, that was really created for out of area crisis management missions and operations. But if you look at you know, the experiences in the Sahel, I guess there are some experiences on the back of Afghanistan, uh, as some of the speakers have rightly pointed out, I mean, there are a number of crises burning around the borderlands of, of Europe. Um, how does that fit into our discussion? Uh, and Max, I'll come to you first, if possible. So, you know, I think in, in our first panel, um, Jessica from NATO mentioned uh, that you know, NATO still has this out of area focus. Let me just say I don't buy it, <laughs> frankly. Uh, I think NATO's focus is back to what it, what it was, and I think what it should be, which is on uh, the conventional and nuclear threat posed by a near peer adversary by Russia. And that should be NATO's core focus. Uh, when we think about out of area operations in the Sahel, I mean, you can look at uh, what's happened in, in the Sahel and in parts of Africa of real security concern to Europe. But I see very little chance that the United States, uh, given our past 20 plus years of being engaged in these types of operations has any appetite to put boots on the ground in uh, a stability op operation, a peacekeeping operation. Now that may change, that may evolve over time. We go through cycles. Uh, where we're never gonna do counterinsurgency again after Vietnam and then 25 years later, that's, that's what we were doing. Um, but I think in the immediate term, this creates a real, uh, I think, dilemma that if there is a situation such as in Mali where if there is a collapse and, and a, a real terrorism threat that then causes a migration crisis for Europe, who is the actor that is going to respond to that? Well, I don't really think it's gonna be France uh, or just France. Uh, I don't see NATO really taking a lead role given I think many in Eastern Europe would rightly say, uh, guys, we have this Russia problem. Uh, and so I think well, that leaves the European Union as the potential uh, actor, which currently doesn't have the capacity to act. And I think that's a real problem. And that we increasingly look at the EU, it has the problems of a superpower, but without the hard power capacities to actually take action. And that's not even just talking about the Indo-Pacific, that means uh, doing, getting EU citizens out of a capital would require the United States to provide, to provide the core enabling capabilities, the air tankers, the, uh, uh, the ISR, other assets that Europe collectively relies on the United States to provide. And so I think one of the problems that I, I see is that when we think about the, the Indo-Pacific, it boggles my mind right now that in NATO, there are not realistic conversations happening about, well, if there is a war over Taiwan or an Indo-Pacific contingency, what does that mean for the U.S. force presence in Europe? And what you, I think, will get, and then I, I know there's some sort of theoretical conversations, but I don't think we're having those sort of brass tacks conversations, and I think what you would get is oftentimes the U.S. providing a lot of reassurance that no, 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 we'll be there, we'll be there. I don't know what we will 
keep in Europe, but I can tell you a lot will go. And right now, Europeans are making long-term acquisition decisions about what they're buying that will appear not in 2025, but in 2030. It strikes me that we really need to be telling them, you need to fill this gap because we will be stretched, whether it's at, uh, at sea, whether it's our naval capabilities, that you know, we're not really gonna be able to you know, send in ships into the Baltic or the high north, or whether it's the enabling capabilities that are, I think, pointed to. Um, so it's those sorts of things that we need to have a realistic conversation and tell Europe to then step up and provide them. The problem is that it's very hard for a single European country to fit the bill to buy those things. Now, there's been a lot of actual collaboration. Uh, we did a report on air enablers, um, and there's been progress by Europeans working together, and I think we need to see uh, a, a lot more of that. Um, maybe just um, one quick point on, on strategic autonomy, where I think strategic autonomy is something that, in, on the one hand, it's sort of dead, because the notion, and I think the, the, the notion of strategic autonomy that I think is dead is the idea that Europe and the United States will sort of drift apart and sort of go our own, sort of own separate directions. That, that, that's not happening. However, I think almost everyone in the United States actually wants strategic autonomy. We actually want the Europeans to be able to do stuff and step up and take action. And Barack Obama in 2011 with, in Libya said, well, we'll lead from behind. We wanted Europe to step up and to act, and then found out that Europe couldn't really do it without our uh, uh, assistance and help. And so I think what we should want of the United States is Europe's ability to act autonomously without us. Now, that doesn't mean that Europe goes its own way. Uh, I don't think it really can, and I'm not worried about that at all. But I think it does mean that we need to start thinking about Europe being able to act whether it's independently of NATO and the United States in an out of area operation, or simply having the backfilling capacities that even if we're still gonna be there in a Russia contingency, maybe we're gonna be really distracted in the Indo-Pacific and so Europe has that uh, insurance to be able to do things uh, if we're not right there uh, uh, doing it for them. Fine points, thanks Max. Justina. Thank you, uh, three um, issues. Crisis management operations, I think we should lower our, our, our ambitions. We should learn from lessons uh, that uh, were made uh, in the Sahel zone, that the French made, the EU made, and the UN made. Uh, Sahel is a rather peripheral, after all, region uh, for European security. We should focus on our uh, nearest neighborhood. Uh, and uh, invest um, uh, our attention and focus there. Uh, South Caucasus, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, Moldova, um, uh, Western Balkans. Uh, I think the, this is our immediate neighborhood and I think we should uh, think how, um, what can we do more um, uh, with regard, for example, to, to Armenia, the French is, uh, the France is, uh, is trying to uh, become more involved. We have a, a good uh, EU mission there on the border with Azerbaijan and Armenia, and we should develop that in order to show the world that we uh, can uh, manage conflict uh, in our uh, immediate uh, neighborhood. So, um, and another point, I think um, you mentioned uh, Europeans should think about replacing US cap uh, capabilities in Europe. Uh, when thinking about strategic competition with Russia, I think um, we should think about it also about an overstretch. Uh, and I do understand the need to build uh, within the EU uh, crisis management capabilities, but having in mind uh, the um, limited possible or, or the lessons learned from, from past uh, missions and operations, um, having in mind uh, uh, goals that we are uh, um, uh, we have placed um, uh, within NATO, uh, I think we should prioritize. And for, 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 from my perspective, priority is NATO, NATO uh, the cap capabilities um, uh, requirements within the, uh, the NDPP, and uh, after then we can think about uh, uh, building crisis management operation uh, uh, capabilities structures uh, within the EU. 
uh, that would be my answer to this question. Uh, linking uh, the theatres, um, uh, from Eastern flank uh, perspective, it's obvious. If there will be a contingency in the Indo-Pacific, Russia will use that to strike uh, in uh, Eastern Europe, either widening the conflict uh, in Ukraine, uh, attacking any other neighbor, or attacking NATO ally, uh, uh, one of the NATO allies. So we do think about such scenarios. And we do, we do think about US uh, with uh, force, especially with US uh, Navy and US Air Force being much more committed, if not fully committed, to the Indo-Pacific theater. I think with, in case of the US Army, the story is a bit different. Uh, US Army is um, uh, the mostly involved in Europe and uh, on the eastern flank, and I think we can count to a large extent uh, on their presence in both theaters. Uh, as, far as, I, uh, as far as I understand, U.S. Army is trying to develop uh, uh, capabilities, uh, capacities to do both. Um, uh, but of course, the U Europeans will have to think about replacing U.S. forces, and uh, I hope that will be also done uh, within uh, uh, regional defense planning, uh, taking into consideration different scenarios, and uh, one of them are like this. Uh, strategic autonomy. EU strategic autonomy um, understood as uh, uh, EU taking the task of collective defense, I think this is simply not feasible uh, because it involves building structures, processes, capabilities that the EU, and that will take years and we do not have time and money to do so. Uh, we need to concentrate on NATO and how the Europeans uh, should uh, in, uh, invest much more uh, in NATO, engage much more uh, um, uh, within the alliance so that we change the balance of the 50% uh, of uh, capabilities the US right now is providing within, within NATO. I think that we should uh, look at the deterrence and defense in Europe also from the Russian perspective and think what Russia perceives, uh, how Russia perceives the deterrence. And uh, I personally don't think that Russia perceives the EU as a, an organization that can provide ultimate deterrence and defense in Europe, uh, especially in the nuclear, in nuclear dimension. And therefore, the, uh, it's not, uh, I would rather bet on the NATO and um, including much more the French into the NATO planning uh, um, uh, with, uh, with regard to nuclear, uh, then moving this conversation out of NATO uh, uh, to the EU. Thanks, Justina. Alexander. Um, let me perhaps start with uh, um, the question on cross-regional dynamics, uh, because it is uh, a very important one, uh, both in the U.S. defense uh, conversation and in the in the NATO conversation. And I think the new family of um, of NATO plans have enabled um, European nations. Uh, their defense planning communities to really understand what is now really needed as far as capabilities are concerned. And that conversation is taking place against the background of a growing realization that uh, US military bandwidth uh, is to uh, a certain degree overstretched and therefore um, Europeans cannot assume that um, the same share that they usually associated with um, uh, the United States will, uh, will appear in, in crises. So I think the awareness about the potential and the risk of crisis simultaneity mm. is growing uh, and therefore for um, um, filling all the, the requirements that the regional plans are generating, uh, that the, the bulk of the effort really uh, comes uh, to, to fall uh, and rest uh, on, uh, on European uh, shoulders of individual European nations, uh, Canada and, uh, and Turkey. So I think also the impact of China's emergence is making itself felt in NATO, uh, not in the sense that Europeans are going to uh, be heavily involved militarily in that theater, but the, the interdependence between the theaters also as far as the nuclear, uh, the nuclear uh, um, uh, deterrence interdependence is concerned, 
Uh, that's an important one because it, it will be especially also U.S. theater level nuclear capabilities that will become substantially overstretched uh, in, 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 in simultaneous uh, crises. And you see the rhythm that uh, the, the, the bomber task force missions uh, are now sort of undertaking world, worldwide. It is, uh, it is really putting uh, an amount of, uh, of, of stress that, uh, that, is, that is unhealthy. Now, the good news, turning to, uh, to Joe Ballard's uh, question, uh, I think as far as ground forces, etc., uh, are concerned, those requirements, they're really already in there. They're very substantial, and it just uh, it takes time uh, to grow um, force structures uh, because putting orders for buying stuff, that can go relatively fast. Growing personnel force structures that's an entirely different proposition. And that is also the, the real constraint uh, on long-term uh, budget growth. European uh, nations need to uh, sort of remobilize their population to serve. Uh, and, and that is uh, the, uh, the generational uh, undertaking. Uh, very quickly, um, um, a, a sort of rhetorical re reply on the strategic autonomy uh, discussion. If you would, in the US, political conversation propose, let's, um, uh, let's delegate commander-in-chief authority to the UN Secretary General. Hmm? You could make that argument, but it would probably be seen very much as a, as a fringe argument. Now, Europeans have been having that conversation in the past, semi-seriously, I would say. Because they've actually done it as far as monetary policy is concerned. They set up a central bank, put one president of the European Central Bank in charge. So it is very illuminating uh, how the, uh, the first big currency crises that the, uh, the single currency went through uh, developed in the time frame 2008, 2009. Uh, because that confronted all the member states of the, uh, of the Economic and Monetary Union with the question, what happens if the ship really hits the proverbial fan? And the outcome was, yes, the European Central Bank will do its best, but as far as managing debts is concerned, the bulk of the effort will remain on the shoulders of individual states. And that same dawning realization is now happening uh, in, uh, in the defense realm, uh, where ultimately nations, uh, European nations, are looking at defense seriously again and actually realizing, oh shit, the, bu the buck ultimately stops uh, um, and falls on the shoulders uh, of, of the states, uh, in line, by the way, with the, the European treaties, the European treaty framework, you can only uh, change it uh, through unanimity, uh, including the consent of, uh, of some countries that uh, think that the very idea of deterrence and nuclear deterrence is actually immoral and should be, um, uh, or is considered illegal, etc. So that is really not happening. The buck stops and falls on the shoulders of the states. Yeah, many things to read to, to. <laughs> that's basic. That's always um, a bit the treat of speaking uh, as the fourth pers person on a panel. So maybe I quickly start with this question of strategic autonomy. Um, this argument um, on, or, I mean, this argument is actually recurrent that basically, um, to simplify it, let's abandon any idea of European strategic autonomy Anyway, you don't have the nuclear capacities, so forget about that. But I think, of course, it's kind of the overkill argument, if you want to call it like that. But I find it a bit simplistic, um, because as my co-speakers here outlined, I mean, if it really comes to the capacity to act and the ability to act, and what I think is important to underline in this regard, really based on European interests and um, adapting or based on European strategy, that um, basically helps Europe to pursue these interests, um, the fact of not being able to, in the last resort, have your own nuclear defense should not um, prevent Europeans to look for lower hanging fruits. 
in other realms of international security. So I mean, yes, of course you can make that argument, but just because you can't have the highest level gold standard of, of European defense, wouldn't mean that you shouldn't at least try to get a lower level and get things done there. Which brings me to that um, question of crisis management. Um, and there I think um, the point that uh, Justina pointed out is very illustrative of the conversations that Europeans will most likely have in the nearer future or in the not so distant future. And that is the question of prioritization. What should we do if there is like the need to simultaneously manage crisis? And um, I feel that since the beginning of Russia's war against Ukraine, we are not um, sufficiently having this discussion among Europeans. What happens if our security priorities or the security priorities of member states do not converge to the extent that they do at the moment? Um, since uh, February 2022, the picture is quite clear. The threat number one is Russia, and then there are also other threats, but the number one threat is very clear. Um, I think when we think ahead, like, I don't know, five years or so, um, the perception in member states that are not on the eastern flank might shift away from that. And how do we balance this need to contain Russia and to have a very solid defense at the eastern flank to potentially doing crisis management in the Sahel? So I'm, I share this perception that France is certainly not going to volunteer to go um, on a, on a mission there again, but depending on how the situation develops, there might indeed be um, a quest for doing more as Europeans, not necessarily in the Sahel, but potentially also in imaginable con conflicts in the Middle East or in North Africa. So I think that is something that will be a painful discussion because it means trade-offs. And um, I have the impression that Europeans are nowhere near uh, ready to have these dis discussions. Um, a last point I would want to pick up is this idea of small wars and um, strategic competition. Because I think that also perfectly links to this question of prioritization. Um, which strategic competition is a state more, or are, you, are individual European states most concerned about? Is it Russia? Is it China? In that context again, how is the Russia-China um, friendship, access, call it how you want? evolving because I think that will also massively shape how Europeans um, or individual states prioritize in terms of um, security threats and also um, this of course will then also um, Im directly impact their willingness to for example get involved in crisis management. Thank you very much for those responses. You want to come back on something Max? Or? Yeah I wanted Please. to um maybe push back a little bit on, on Alexander. I, I think um, it is true that the security burden w w is going to fall on, on the states in Europe, and, and I think that's uh, very much the case. However, I think your analogy is quite apt when looking at the fi financial side, right? That what, what you know, Europe created a monetary union, then suddenly realized, oh no, we don't have any fiscal union. Yet we have a major problem when a COVID crisis erupts and there's a potential economic catastrophe in Southern Europe and then suddenly create this ability to borrow for the first time and then borrow to then effectively do some of what our federal government does when there's an economic crisis that provide a certain stimulus to uh, and step in. And it, it strikes me that something similar has happened on the migration side. Europe sort of got rid of borders internally, then realized, oh my God, we don't have a common border and, uh, and asylum and migration policy, and now we're trying to forge that. But you know, well and behold, Europe created uh, essentially Frontex, a, a border service that can then augment uh, national borders because suddenly it's not just on Greece to protect Greece, to protect the national borders of Greece, but that impacts in all of Europe. And lo and behold, Frontex now has drones, has guns, has has vehicles. Uh, and I see, you know, it is true that the treaties do restrict what the EU can do. However, the language is actually very vague. There are great lawyers in, uh, within the EU, and we're seeing that with the EU's decision and ability to go and buy ammunition. And it strikes me as that one of the evolutions that we're seeing, that we should see, is that there's a need for the EU to augment the member states. And I think this isn't about the EU sort of stepping in as the kind of core you know, actor to deter Russia. This is more about where are the gaps 
the EU can harness and leverage its, its uh, fiscal capacity, f fiscal potential, and make certain investments that can then help fill these gaps that really at a national level are not going to be prioritized. And it's very simple in, in a number of cases about Ukraine. It is about getting the production lines going. Mm -hmm. And right now they're not going fast enough because member states have not yet put in the contracts that are needed, whether it's tanks, whether it's ammunition, whether it's air defense. And those are the things that are needed to restock European uh, shelves, but also are needed to, I think, you know, support the war effort in Ukraine. And that's where if member states are going to be focused more in the medium and long term about their, their militaries, well, that's a, a, a real gap for the EU to fill. So I think it's that gap filling capacity that I think we're, that at least I'm pointing to. Yeah, thanks, Max. I also detect that also in the response uh, to Russia's invasion that there's much more consensus on this point about filling the gaps, mm -hmm. enablement as well. It's been one of the issues which has certainly, I think, been at the basis of more unity between European countries. I want to come to Gazin first and I'll come to you, Justina. Unless you want to... I want to jump jump on that. What do you think, Gazin? Should I? Um, maybe. Both want I, to I also in? want to add something to Max, so I think you can potentially then jump on what I would say. <laughs> um, because I think what Max is pointing out is exactly um, the important thing, so underlining how much can actually be done in the EU. And I would say particularly from a transatlantic perspective, when it comes also to the question of what should the EU contribute, I think it's important to have a certain shift of mindset here. Um, and not only see the EU as an actor as such, um, but also see the EU really as um, yeah, a kind of hub, because the EU is, um, as often as we criticize that, very bureaucratic and also has a lot of tools and instruments. I mean, we all know the acronym SOUP and all that, but that can also be a strength. That can be a strength for, for coordination and for really leveraging all the agencies and, and instruments that are there. And I think um, instead of thinking about it as a block with massive uh, geopolitical ambitions, I'm exaggerating a bit, um, and of course these ambitions should also be there from a European side, but I also think it would be very important to see it as, um, as a sort of instrument or a hub that brings so many strengths together um, and that can basically really in terms of pure coordination do things that Europeans individually cannot do and that NATO also due to a lack of funding for example cannot do. Thanks so much, Justine. Yeah, I think this is a, um, a topic where we all do agree that the EU should be a support, rather supportive actor, um, enabling cooperation like uh, uh, joint production um, of ammunition, like EPF and funding uh, uh, arms militaries, uh, uh, arms uh, deliveries for Ukraine, jo joint procurement, and so on for the needs of NATO. And I think there is a broad agreement on that, also from the countries of the, uh, that are uh, Eastern flank countries, and that uh, in the past years have been very skeptical of the development of e uh, CSDP um, uh, within, within the EU. So this is, I think, uh, uh, good news that we, we all agree and would like to develop um, uh, cap capabilities and, uh, and initiatives uh, that uh, enhance deterrence and defense uh, in Europe via the EU. The EU. Thanks for that. Alexander, you want to come back on any point that you've heard? I'll just add one simple detail. The analysis, what is actually needed for transatlantic um, security and defense is ultimately drawn up by the NATO command structure at shape. Where else does the statement of requirement come from? Yeah, I, I also wanted, I mean, I'm, I'm going to look to see if there are any more hands because we're ru steadily running out of time. Um, but I did want to complicate the discussion even further, which is that I noticed uh, some of you, one or two of you directly mentioned China, but some of you skirted around it by using the Indo-Pacific label. So I'm also wondering, I think, Justina, you actually mentioned a really interesting point, which is the... Um, how China's actions will feature in Russia's calculations vis-a-vis -vis Europe. I just want to see if I can get one last word because I, I sense it's going to be underlying a lot of the discussions even at the Washington summit, even if it's not you know, explicitly mentioned. Um, but how should Europeans think of China in this context that we've been discussing, also given that both in the strategic concept of NATO and in the EU's own strategic compass, 
China features in both of these documents, but what more are we expecting? Is it just um, Europeans simply ticking the China box to please a, a few uh, partners? Or is there something of substance behind that, really? Who wants to tackle that easy question? Maybe we'll go in reverse order, and I'll, I'll give Max the last word. Sorry, Gazine, that was very unfair on you, but... <laughs> I'm fine with that. Um, so, um, is it just Europeans ticking the box on China, putting it in the strategic concept, uh, compass, so that the US is happy with that, to see it there? I don't think so. Um, because all the economic interdependence that Europeans have with China makes it an absolute strategic imperative mm. for Europe um, both on the national level of individual states, but also really on the EU level, because, for example, trade is an EU competence, to think about how Europeans deal with China and overall the situation in the Indo-Pacific. And I think that is even more relevant um, also, again, in light of the elections here next year, um, because US-China policy will significantly impact what Europeans um, will potentially be asked to do, and also um, where they might, or how they might want to adapt their own strategy. Because, um, for example, the narrative of, um, that we hear from the Biden administration that defending Taiwan is in the national US interest is something that is not shared, or militarily defending Taiwan, is something that I think would, would be signed only very hesitantly if at all, in European capitals. And um, in this regard, particularly when it comes to cooperation in the, in the Indo-Pacific, that also that all comes back to this definition of strategic autonomy and defining European interests and also defining European strategies based on these interests. So um, for Europeans, there is no way around the Indo-Pacific from a purely economic perspective. But this economic importance also needs to translate in security policy. And um, I feel that at the moment, Europeans are still very far away from having a line on how they wanted to react in case of um, an escalation there. I think we see hopeful signs, like for example, naval coordination of the deployments of individual states. We had um, France, Germany, and the UK simultaneously are coordinating their deployments. We see more and more areas um, for coordinated maritime presences that also are very present in the strategic compass. So we see that the reflections are going on. Um, and I don't think that it is only a lip service, but I think um, it is a conversation that is going too slowly and that Europeans really need to step up there also because of this interconnectedness of theaters. Thanks, Gizzi. Alexander. Well, on China, um, the European Commission, uh, within its competences, uh, is now uh, um, proposing uh, and promoting uh, a de-risking agenda that is uh, widely uh, welcomed. Um, it is a compromise, uh, as all things, uh, in, in the European Union. Um, but I think the important bit here is that uh, the EU's thinking on China is evolving. It's a dynamic uh, object. Um, uh, and, uh, and by and large, that process is, is now underway. Now, the China question also raises uh, um, a variety of hard security uh, uh, questions. China is in the process of really becoming the third the world's third nuclear superpower. Uh, that is where we will be, uh, give it uh, 10 or 10, 15, 15 years. That will have dramatic uh, and is already having uh, an impact uh, on, on the NATO debate. Uh, it is something that um, the, um, uh, the national security establishment of individual European states uh, are also paying uh, close, uh, close attention to, uh, but that is happening also in, in those contexts. So there is a certain uh, um, uh, issue with the fact that multiple conversations are being conducted in silos where they're, where they're really part of a broader uh, uh, strategic uh, conversation. But yeah, that is where we are. Um, we'll find ways to overcome that because we've We've done it in the past as well, so we'll get there. It just takes a bit of time and conversation. Muddling through. <laughs> Justina. 
Yes, modeling theory is a good uh, sum up. Uh, I think um, uh, there is uh, certainly the thinking is evolving uh, on China and how to deal with the challenge or threat. But I think that Western Europe, as I said before in my introduction, uh, has still difficulties with the understanding that we deal with uh, uh, deep shifts in international politics and that the era of confrontation is already there. A confrontation with Russia and a confrontation with China. Uh, and therefore, I don't think uh, there is no thinking still about enhancing deterrence in, in the Pacific in order to prevent contingencies uh, in Europe. But I think we will will come to this thinking so sooner or later. Uh, I think France uh, doesn't want to get into U.S.-China uh, conflict. Uh, very cautious about uh, involving NATO in the, in the Pacific. Uh, Germany deludes itself in the thinking that uh, we are not in a strategic competition with Russia or China. Um, I think that Eastern flank countries think about that more and more. Uh, due to the, um, uh, the, I mentioned that we are thinking about the future of the U.S. engagement in Europe, and uh, a spillover of the, um, uh, if we have uh, a conflict uh, in the Indo-Pacific, what that would uh, mean for us. Uh, it is also in the early stages, but I think the understanding is already there, and the thinking will follow. Thanks, Justine. Max. So, I, I, I think. In the Indo-Pacific, there's the EU essentially has the the interests of of a superpower, interest, same kind of equivalent interests of the United States in many respects, at least economically. The EU has a huge interest in a free and open Indo-Pacific and maintaining stability and trade ties and uh, and and so in the EU, this is an area where. You know, I think we're seeing in the Middle East the limitations of a geopolitical Europe where the EU has no hard, cap hard power capacity. But in the Indo-Pacific and with China, the EU is a global power given the, its geoeconomic tools, that the competencies that have been vested in Brussels in terms of trade, regulatory, climate, uh, technology policy, uh, now increasingly uh, protection of the common market, uh, um, all of these are incredibly important for China policy, which is why there's a USEU trained technology council that the United States created, not because it wanted to have lots of bureaucratic discussions with the Europeans, but because they recognized, man, really? getting on the same page with the EU is really essential to our China policy. So that said, I think the EU, the EU has become an increasingly important actor in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and actually, EU signaling uh, plays a very important deterrence role, particularly on the, uh, on the economic side. And I think that also uh, lends itself to some degree on the military side with the freedom of navigation operations, the FONOPS that European countries do, while a German frigate going through the Taiwan Straits isn't necessarily you know, sending a huge deterrence signal. I do think that if these operations became more Europeanized, uh, and the EU is a, a presence, I think, in Chinese thinking, that I think that, that matters. But that said, from a, from a hard security standpoint, I completely agree with Justina, that if there were, you know, was to be a conflict in the Indo-Pacific, the major question is, what does Russia do? Then the question is, what US assets are taken out, and what can Europe do to essentially uh, ensure that deterrence uh, remains and that it is postured in a very strong way vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. And so I think when we think about Europe's role militarily in the Indo-Pacific, I think it has an incredibly important role, but much of the military role may be uh, in, in Europe. One final point is that what we have, one of the major lessons I think from Ukraine uh, and this wasn't reflected, I think, in the National Defense Strategy, which came out last year, actually, to my real surprise, even though it was delayed, is how critical defense industrial production is, how critical it is to have, you know, that when you're in a shooting war, you pull the trigger a lot. You need to have huge, huge stocks and huge capacity. Well, Europe has large defense industrial capacity. Now, it's not activated the way it should be. But in a conflict in the Indo-Pacific in which the U.S. is using long-range fires and precision guided munitions, uh, and, you know, uh, running through its stocks, the fact that the U.K., France, and others can produce long-range missiles is incredibly important. The fact that Europe has shipbuilding capacity is something that I think is potentially incredibly important. 
Uh, and these are the things that, that you know, I think that the Pentagon has talked about interchangeability, that our ability to do what the Ukrainians are doing, where somehow able to put U.S. missiles on a MiG fighter jet. Th that sort of interchangeability, I think, is incredibly important uh, in a potential Indo-Pacific scenario and something I think is, is underappreciated. Uh, and so with that, given this is my last word, let me thank you, Daniel, for, for moderating this panel. I also want to thank you all for being here and thank uh, NATO for their support for enabling this, this, not just this event series, but the one that we had in, in Brussels. But I'll turn the floor over, over yeah. to you to close. Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, before thanking each of uh, you excellent speakers uh, up here, let me as well thank um, those of you who joined us here today, those who spoke on the first panel, uh, and also those online. I believe there's a small army uh, following us online, which is good. Um, I just want to thank CSIS, uh, Max and NCC, but also those that you can't necessarily see behind the scenes, um, also helping us back in Brussels as well. That very, very um, a shout out to them uh, back home. Um, also thanks to NATO. I think what has been quite extraordinary with the two events that we have, have managed to organize, first in Brussels and, and now in DC, is also seeing some similar lines across the two uh, um, conferences but also how fast some of the issues have evolved even in the space of a few months. So heading into the Washington summit, I, I guess um, there'll be further evolutions and, and further change. And hopefully after Washington, uh, the Washington summit will be able to um, uh, organize another event at some point and uh, take stock again uh, of where we are. So a big thanks um, for the event side. And now let me uh, invite you all to give our speakers uh, a warm round of applause for the excellent contributions. Thanks.